when I was in the US that I was asking myself all the time if that's actually a thing. And when I was like on second or fourth the time on the internet in the US that I was asking myself all the time if that's actually a thing. And when I was like
All right. I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, welcome to the last Monday morning tech chat show of the month, of the year, of the decade. Mom, bom, bom. <laughs> I am Juan Carlos Bagnell, so, a.k.a. Some Gadget Guy, the SGG of this terribly named podcast series, and the QA stands for question and answer. I like to make my Monday morning streams interactive so we can have a conversation, we can have a chat. I'm already seeing an amazing lineup of familiar faces. I mean, like, it's romper room style. Boyang Bite, Steve, Fat Produce, Aditya Anil, Matt Tyler, Vazikos. Um, I, there are more in here, I'm sure. <clears throat> Rosted. So uh, we're going to have a lovely, chill conversational podcast back and forth because I, I, I normally I would make this a news heavy type of podcast but we're getting to the end of the year I have gotten some follow-up questions from my last podcast two weeks ago that I want to talk about uh, this week here too uh, we only have a teeny little bit of housekeeping to cover but I want to kick off this this podcast this time of year as we get to the end of the year as we start looking towards the next year, what's to come, the future. It's always a contemplative time. And I wanted to spend this time in my pajamas, my Starfleet Academy pajama shirt, um, hanging out with you guys, looking back, where we've come, where tech has gone, some of the some of the biggest issues that we've discussed on this podcast, and then also just a, a focus on the gadgets, the actual hardware that sort of sparked our interests in being tech enthusiasts. And I, I just feel like this is the right time to do it. You know, we're going through all of these lists, the, the best phones of the year, the biggest flops, uh, where tech has gone over the last 10 years. And I just feel like this is this is a, a good interactive conversation for us to have, not just me sitting here telling you, well, and this was the winner and this was the loser. I, I'm not particularly interested in that conversation. Now, I would like to say, uh, secondly, um, happy holidays. We're, we're, we're in between uh, Christmas and New Year's. I, you know, there was Hanukkah and Kwanzaa. I don't know if I've got any serious practitioners of Festivus in my live stream or not. Um, but we're, um, we're all in that holiday season. I hope, like my hope for you every, every day, but especially on the special days, that you are safe, warm, well-fed, and spending time with people who care about you. Also, that you've gotten some time away from the people who care about you, because I know hanging out with family can be really stressful. So if you're you know, sneaking away to listen to this podcast or you just have it on some headphones while you're sort of navigating your New Year's festivities, I appreciate you. I appreciate your listening, your support, and of course, above all else, your participation. I would not be wanting uh, to I, I would not be continuing to produce these these live streams and these videos if it weren't for the amazing uh, conversations that we have. Uh, Boeing Bite, how was your Christmas, Juan? Uh, Matt Tyler, this podcast is family time. I love hearing that, and especially Matt Tyler. Uh, I'm get, getting you that shout out because uh, I, I know your, your daughters have listened to the show uh, occasionally. Um, and Sam, I love being off every other Monday now. And getting getting Sam in on the live feed is is awesome too. Uh, Boing bite. My Christmas was was interesting. Um, you know, I, I'm I am the father of a four year old daughter, and uh, my wife and I uh, we we have one kid. We're going through all of these experiences fresh as parents. This Christmas was was very telling. Um. My daughter kind of got hit with an onslaught of presents on Christmas morning. And that's not a bad thing. My, my family was amazing. Um, my wife and I, we tried to keep our, our gifts really select. Uh, select. So we got her uh, this really cute little kid piano that's properly noted. so that And it's built for little kid hands so she can start learning how to play the piano. But she got so many toys and so many books and stuffed animals. And Santa got her some Duplos and... And I, I'm looking back now, and I think it was just a little too much for a four-year-old. Just the, the, the amped excitement of new thing, getting new thing, unwrapping gift, unwrapping gift. 
And I'm looking at the photos uh, that we took as she's unwrapping. And the first couple is this this beaming four year old face. And then as we're getting to the end of the pile, it, it she looks like shell shocked. She's got like a thousand yard stare. I mean, I, I actually think we we overdid all of the neurochemicals, uh, all of the dopamine uh, hits that a, that a four year old could handle. And it, it's it's interesting. I, I don't know that she really enjoyed it. You know, like, um, you know, you see a, a I, I hate that I'm about to compare my daughter to a dog here, but you see a, a dog wagging its tail. That's not necessarily happy. That's an excited state. And I think we just kept her in an excited state for two days straight from Christmas Eve and baking cookies and singing Christmas carols and going out to see holiday Christmas lights and Christmas, 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 Christmas. And then through opening gifts, when we know she didn't get a good night's sleep, you never get a good night's sleep when you think Santa's going to come. And then um, burning her out on Christmas morning. Um, by the time she had food, like real food, it was already like 10 a.m. It was just, I think it was a bit too much. And so then I look, you know, what we did after. We ate breakfast. We just got out of the house for a little bit. My, my aunt got her this little kid camera. Not the best camera. I mean, it's just one of those old, you know, point and shoot sensors. It's like an eight megapixel camera. But then she was doing something and she was out with her mom and her dad. We were getting some fresh air. We were getting a walk. And that's when it started to feel like Christmas. She she went to town on this little camera. She's now taking pictures of her food. She's figured out how to shoot video. So she's doing videos for Nani and Grandpa and Grandma and Poppy that 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 one that one thing just getting to focus on on one present and and especially something where she's naturally a very creative and expre- uh, expressive kid that that's when it finally started to feel like christmas so uh, just really um really thankful and really grateful and getting to spend some time with my family and then learning some lessons like the christmas morning this year i feel like i didn't really do my job as a parent but getting into Christmas afternoon, we salvaged the day. <laughs> you know, like all the things that my daughter is going to talk, talk about in therapy when she's in her 20s. Um, from Sam, all of that can be overwhelming. Absolutely. She had a, a really, I, I think she had a really tough time that morning. Um, and, and also from Sam, I remember my girls and it was nuts. Um from Boeing Bite, future videographer, maybe. I I mean, like this this girl um, is is like taking my phones, and she also uh, stole one of my Kodak cameras. If, if I can find it during the stream, I'll pull it up because just proud Papa. But like, she's starting to figure out composition, and she's starting to figure out not just like how these things work. She gets how a shutter button works on a camera, but it's it's exciting again, like getting to experience those things fresh see them through a new pair of eyes, watching her learn and kind of stumble and then figure things out. It's it's just really exciting. <laughs> From Fat Produce, uh, your daughter would be in therapy because she loves her dad so much. <laughs> Hashtag wholesome anti-diss. I love it. And, and so because of that, we're also going to try, uh, because of Christmas morning, my wife and I, we're not going to try and do anything too extravagant for New Year's. Uh, we're really looking at, you know, um, how to spend some time together. I'm going to make up some pozole. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. We're going to eat a ton of food. Um, we, we, we might have a couple cousins come over just to watch the ball drop. But, um, I, again, it's like learning our lessons one holiday at a time. Again, we, we want to clean everything up, get our living room put back in, in order because it's still – an explosion of what we had for Christmas. And then we're going to have to start taking down the tree and, and, and all of those cleaning rituals. And then also just, I want to be able to spend just some time with my wife, you know, just like, Hey, remember we like each other too. So, um, it's, a uh, it's crazy stuff. So I, I hope everyone has had that, that kind of, you know, moment or that, that at least that part of a day, where you've you've gotten to sort of invest in what makes this time of year special. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let me get this out of the way here. And um, oh, from Sam, she comes from good stock and has a good mentor. 
Um, especially between my wife and I, uh, she's ex- very articulate, very well spoken, and uh, she's got a pretty good technical edge. Although, for for all of my dance background, I did think I do think she got a little bit of my wife's clumsiness. She she commits to an action before I think she can really uh, pull off that action. So it's it's good times. Mark Northgraves, hey, what's up? Okay. Uh, There is a a bit of housekeeping. Two weeks ago, we talked about some of this stuff. I just want to repost it here. Um, Obviously, you can hear my my voice is still kind of shaky. I blew it out bad two weeks ago. In fact, you can hear at the very tail end of the last podcast, my voice went straight acid. Um, This is maybe the worst lockup I think I've had since getting whooping cough 11 years ago. And... uh, then I still had to get some videos done for Newegg, and I was still producing for, for another uh, contract that I'm working on. And uh, I, I've, I've tried to spend as much time of the last two weeks not talking as possible. But I think you'll hear probably by the time we get to the end of the show, it's, it's going to be a bit rough again. So getting into some housekeeping, I just want to pull this up. Um, I, I'm not going to be doing a lot of news, or any news. I don't have any links pulled. This week, I kind of feel like news can can miss us this week <laughs> while we talk about some stuff that's maybe a bit more fun. Um, let me get this uh, screen shared here. So I, I do want to reiterate, I've been slowly plugging through phones and updates. So um, where the Nokia 9 PureView got Android 10 and uh, the OnePlus 6 got Android 10. I'm writing up an article on the Xperia 5. Uh, I've, I've finally gotten some time to play with Android 10 on that phone. And just looking at the landscape, instead of making everything a video, some some of these written articles, quick, punchy, just get to the point. You don't need me to like intro and then give you a whole spiel about subscribing and stuff like that. Um, th- this is actually going to be an initiative for 2020 is getting back more into writing and keeping that byline active. But you can catch some of those articles, somegadgetguy.com. Then also just reiterating, we I did get a Pixelbook Go review out recently, um, looking at some of the reasons why I really enjoyed revisiting uh, Chrome OS and Chromebooks, that this is great hardware. And then also some of the reasons that, I mean, Google includes some extra... Uh, fun stuff on the Pixelbook Go. I don't think it's the primary focus of the Pixelbook Go, but it is one of the major reasons why I like this uh, this product so much. So the Pixelbook Go review, I love it for reasons Google might not like. Um, again, I- I'm still I'm actually still digging into what else I can do on a Pixelbook. It's kind of interesting. The uh, the main focus is simplicity and ease of use and getting a web browser up and running. <clears throat> but uh, there's a whole subculture of people that are like ripping these things open and trying to get, you know, as much use out of them as they can. Uh, oh, not a coon. I've been in and out of a cold for the past three weeks. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's uh, it's rough when you keep like lingering on a cough because that's kind of where I'm at right now. Now, lastly, uh, th- this was a fun video. It's not a review. I'm not blowing anyone's mind here. Um, and Nabong, S- Nabong Su9, I've butchered your name and I apologize. Hello from the Philippines. Uh, thank you for joining the broadcast. Um, I'm not blowing anyone's mind. The Sony A7 III, mirrorless camera, full frame sensor, Everyone knows <laughs> that this is a beast of a camera. Um, probably, I, I, I don't think it's hyperbole to say it's currently the best full-frame camera on the market today, weighing all of the features, the the price, uh, the, the collection of lenses. Sony glass is great. I, I, I go into this more in the video, and I'm not going to repeat the whole video here. But when I started working with Sony PR to get a loaner for the Xperia, um, the Xperia 5, it was a new PR rep. I've been through four Sony PR agencies over the last three years, Um, especially like I had a great relationship with Sony during the Xperia XZ1 and XZ1 compact days. 
two other PR agencies that would give me the sort of stock reply on queries like, hey, I was really hoping I could review an XZ2. Yeah, we'll put you on the list and then would never hear back from them. And so I finally got my hands on an Xperia 1. It was a short term loaner, but I was like, OK, cool. I'm working with Sony again. I'm very happy. There's something about the Sony brand. It's like Sony and Nokia. It's a classic company, a classic tech company. And we know when they do something really well, they do it really, really well. So I get a message right before the Xperia 5 launches. Oh, um, we're the PR company that you've worked with. Uh, we're just letting you know that we will not be doing any work with Sony in the future. And we're passing you along to yet another PR agency. And I'm just like, I worked all, I worked this hard to build up a new relationship. You know, let me just shoot them an email. Hi, I'm Juan. I produce this on Gadget Guy. I recently reviewed the Xperia 1. Happy to get to know you. Looking forward to working with you. Yada, yada, yada. And um, they that that was a, a Friday night. So I, it was like 7 o'clock my time, which means it was 10 o'clock Eastern time. And I got an immediate reply. Hey, Juan, so glad to meet you. Hey, we're really excited. To, and we saw the Xperia 1 video. This is great. I like That's never happened with PR for me ever before um where anyone has not only gotten back to me that fast but like knew my work and seemed happy <laughs> that i was reaching out to them um so uh already now now like oh well this is gonna be great so we're we we chat out like hey um i'd love to spend some time with the xperia 5 uh they, they've actually let me keep it longer uh, just because I, I wanted to do just that little bit of extra coverage on Android 10. Um, great. This is the great working relationship. Right after they send me the Xperia 5, the, she sends me, uh, the, the PR rep sends me another message saying, hey, Juan, just looking through your videos, do you really use all of the gear that you list in every one of your YouTube videos? Because I just have a gear list. You know, this is this is what I actually use to produce my videos. And I go, well, yeah, yeah. And she goes, and she like replies. This is like a back and forth, like three, three or four emails back and forth. Like, so you're really shooting on a Panasonic? <laughs> and I'm adding like the little pauses and up inflections to her speech because it's an email. But I'm getting the feeling like she's kind of making fun of me. <laughs> so uh, that that's how this came about. Um after making fun of me for using a Panasonic, the, the video, the, the camera that I'm using for this stream right now, uh, she uh, she worked out like, well, you've got to take a short term loaner on a Sony camera. I, I'm at, She actually came from the Sony camera division, which, again, if you come from the Sony camera division uh, doing PR for them, you come into these conversations a lot more confident. And that that kind of all mixed up together. It, it was so refreshing talking to a PR rep that was confident and bold and forward about the brand they were representing. Because I've had conversations with some other companies, PR agencies and PR reps where in the conversation, it already feels like they're defeated. It, before the phone is, the, before the gadget is even out in the market, there's already the sense of, well, we know it's probably not going to do well. But here I am talking to a PR rep on the side of a company that couldn't be um, more competitive, that, that, that is at the top of their game, that is executing one of the highest quality products of the market, of the segment, and is completely deserving of all the praise that they've been getting. So again, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not blowing anyone's mind. This is not a review, but I, I spent two weeks shooting on an A7 III uh, Christmas morning where my Christmas photos of Lex um, day crescendo into a toddler uh, with a thousand yard stare. Everything was shot on a full frame camera, an A7 III. Um, and and it, was, it was a refreshing change of pace. I have not shot full frame since the Canon 5D one, the, the very first Canon 5D. And, and it just kind of rekindled um, my love of fancy cameras and good glass where I used to like drool and obsess over Canon L glass, the Sony 50 millimeter lens is disgustingly good. <laughs> like I really liked shooting on that lens. 
So I, I, I don't know that I'm going to switch formats again. I'm, I'm happy with my Panasonic. And for video, it, it's, a, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, act to follow. It's, it's hard to beat Panasonic for video. It really is. Um, but for stills, oh, God. Um, taking it out to shoot Christmas lights. There's a, a neighborhood called that they do Candy Cane Lane uh, every year here in the Valley. And um, just get those beautiful defocused bokeh balls of Christmas lights. I just like I've got gigabytes and giga. I, I think I shot 120 gig of photos over two days on flower shots and Christmas lights. I just the camera was so much fun to use. So I share more thoughts in that video, and you can check that out um, somegadgetguy.com and of course uh, YouTube.com/slash Juan Bagnell. Uh, that's it for housekeeping. Um, <clears throat> let me just take a. Ah. Let's see. Oh, from Boeing back. I remember the day I had to install Crouton on a Chromebook. I'm still not even that far. I'm looking at different Linux distributions for Chromebooks and stuff like that. Uh, Matt Tyler, I loved that camera video. But eighteen hundred dollars, yeah, it's an eighteen hundred dollar camera body. <clears throat> but I, I just, what what is so exciting and so compelling? Um, the f smartphones have absolutely. This is one of the things we're gonna we're gonna kind of talk about the the last ten years, what we've been doing over the last ten years. Um, I was gonna save that for the second half of the podcast. But speaking about the A seven three specifically. You know, when Canon launched the 5D and it had a full frame sensor, I want to say that was a $3,500 camera body. That was a $3,500 camera body in money 10 years ago. So the money was worth a bit more and it was a $3,500 camera body. It is so exciting to see in a technical art like photography where you'd think that we'd kind of figured out optics, right? That lenses and, and the philosophy behind lens, lens design improves, but it's not like we're radically changing how a lens operates to focus light onto some kind of light-sensitive medium, uh, film, or a, a digital sensor. So as that technology has progressed, at nearly, at almost half the price of what the Canon 5D launched at years ago it was over 10 years ago um now we've got full frame mirrorless and it's and it's better i mean it's so much better the the video capabilities the the image integrity the image quality the 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 feature set that that's what's so exciting is for as, as much as we think this stuff kind of stagnates it's not going to be the radical change it's not going to be the overnight shift it's the constant evolution and that it pushes prices lower on this kind of tech. I mean, where we'll be in another 10 years. I mean, it, it, it it's insane. And, and it, it, it encourages me. It like, I want to start saving up for like a medium format camera, you know, like a Hasselblad or a Mamiya, you know, something like insane. But those right now are still like $20,000 cameras. So I'm not going to do that anytime soon. Whew. <clears throat> Goran Petrovic in the live chat. Um, fat produce. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. There's going to be a lot of biology and coughing on this podcast, if you hadn't noticed. Uh, I wonder how toxic the management is at Sony to cause such insane PR agency turnover. I don't know that it's toxic. Um, part of this really did feel like Sony was taking back some of the messaging on some of their other products. I don't have any insight. Um, none of them have spoken to me on background or off the record or anything like that. I don't have any special information on Sony and Sony PR. But the experience that I just had from the Xperia 5 to the A7 III felt a lot like the company getting behind the messaging of their products a bit more directly, less let's farm out phones to some cheap PR company and NBD if they don't perform well. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that this is a trend of them putting a bit more of the effort 
behind their other product divisions that they put behind PlayStation and Alpha. It's just like every other company we talk about. If LG put a bit more of the muscle that they have behind their TV division, behind their phone division, I believe their phone division would be a bit healthier. <clears throat> Ditto Sony. You know, they're starting to tie the Xperia line into the same feature set and conversations that they have with their camera division. That, to me, is a more unified brand approach. And so it gives me a little hope. I had such good experiences on the Xperia 1 and the Xperia 5 this year, in part because that new camera app came directly out of the camera software on their um, mirrorless and production, their cinema-grade cameras. That's encouraging. So I, I hope that's a trend that continues. Matt Tyler. <coughs> Apple, Samsung, Asus, Huawei. Useless for not getting you review units. Uh, I'm hoping I, we have a budding relationship with Asus starting up. Um, I'm still talking to the folks at Huawei, but their, their distribution strategy is a bit weird right now. So I, I'm not too... Eh on Huawei, um, like I'm not being too critical of Huawei because there still is an open line of communication there. Apple and Samsung don't need me and they don't need me being in any way critical of their products. So I, I, I'll probably never get an email <laughs> reply <laughs> or a phone call back from Apple or Samsung. Um, and let me get this out of the way here. Oh, from Vazicos 8. This would be pretty cool. Personally, I want computational photography in micro four thirds. From using the Pixel 4, I would love to see that type of image processing become the new version of green box mode on standalone cameras. I don't know that the current standalone camera ISPs can really handle that kind of Image processing, capturing raw images off of larger sensors is a much bigger task, is a much bigger chore than off of our little phone camera sensors. But it would be pretty cool. Um, I, I feel like Google got that phenomenally right in trying to cut all of the extra auto modes. There aren't a dozen different flavors of auto and HDR. Auto mode should be we're using every bit of technology that we can to produce the image totally free of user input you tap to focus you push the shutter that's about as much involvement as you're really expected to to contribute it's just i would love to also see google give us the manual modes to balance that when i want to create something specific for a standalone camera that would be awesome because auto mode on a standalone camera i still think is kind of garbage regardless of the camera i, I just don't think they make great choices unless you take some of the decision making off of their hands. So like I often shoot mostly like aperture priority and making exposure adjustments. <clears throat> but um, that, that becomes a, a bigger ask when you need a lot more computing heavy lifting to finish off the image. <clears throat> Let me take another sip here. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> 2019, the year in review, uh, two pot, two weeks ago, uh, on this podcast, I, I, uh, kind of croaked through the end of the podcast was sort of focused on my assertion that there was no phone of the year. <clears throat> I, I really don't believe there was one a and I'm, I'm increasingly trying not to give in to my darker demons, uh, the sick visceral thrill that we get, <clears throat> the sick visceral thrill that we get w discussing the failures. A couple years back, especially when I revived my personal YouTube channel, I want to say it was the end of 2017, I did a whole series of videos on, you know, how such and such company screwed up. And those videos actually still get traffic today. Um, like surpri a surprising amount of traffic because we all get that, that kind of gross thrill out of sort of knocking a failure. 
and, and I wouldn't even say that that video series was overly negative. It was more, you know, like, for example, I, I remember my Motorola thing was really just, I think they screwed up on naming their products. The products weren't bad. It was, you set up one expectation one year, and then you shifted what that meant the next, the following year. And it confuses people, so that's frustrating. I kind of feel like 2019 was another year where most everything was very good to excellent and we're increasingly debating the minutia of pros and cons, but acting like those tiny differences in user experience are somehow purchasing recommendations or deal breakers. Um, I, I'm, I'm really struggling. I can't say I had a bad experience on any product that I used this year. Um, reviewing Sony, reviewing LG, reviewing Samsung, reviewing... I, I'm spending time with the iPhone 11 Pro. It's a perfectly competitive consumer premium smartphone. There's nothing that's a deal breaker there when we talk about who this phone might be a good fit for. And ditto in Xperia 1. And Xperia 1, obviously is going to be a bit more of a niche player. But for the person who wants that feature set, it's an incredible version of, of a smartphone. LG, V50, G8, G8X. Samsung, the entire Galaxy S and Galaxy Note lineup. Like, everything was executed at a, at a fairly high top tier. And I, I find it to be disingenuous to to try and craft a list of, well, these were the biggest flops of 2019 because ultimately all we're going to do is point to smaller companies that have a smaller market share and I don't feel like punching down. If if, if we're looking at flops, I, I would say for myself personally, and, and again, I don't think I'm rocking the boat too much here, but I think 2019 showed us that the promise of a folding phone was a bit early. We, I, I think we're all pretty confident that we're not going to escape <laughs> this notion of making our devices more expensive and more fragile, um, whether it's a clamshell folder like uh, a Motorola or if it's a mini tablet that becomes an awkward phone like, uh, like the Galaxy Fold. But I would say that was the idea that became this year's 3D TV. An exciting concept, but never really should have been released as a consumer-facing device. And I just think of the missed opportunity. A company like Samsung, they have the resources of Samsung. And if they had made the Galaxy Fold an explorer program, you know, a limited invite, people going firsthand, sharing some tough criticisms, but it's not a real consumer-facing uh, purchasable product how much goodwill they would have built. Samsung, we're at this stage, we really want it, we really need user feedback, but this isn't a product that we want to sell in stores, it's a product that we want to craft and refine and, and get this messaging out. Instead, they got greedy. It's a $2,000 vanity piece that barely functions as an actual daily driver phone. But even then, it's high ambition. So that's the closest I can point to where I feel like we really flopped in 2019 a specialty niche design experiment of a device being put up for consumer purchase. And even that succeeds largely in what it tries to do. It's just not a very practical um, option for general consumers out there. And it didn't really move the needle on, uh, on improving the sort of uh, the, the, the consumer mobile data experience. So um, that, 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 that kind of answers, I, I ended up getting a couple of messages from people saying, not, not that like my podcast two weeks ago was a cop out, but folks were genuinely curious more what some of my personal experiences were, um, tr trying to get a, a handle on what I thought was important in, in 2019. Um, I think this is going to be an increasing challenge. I know I didn't really succeed last year for my um, 
uh, my New Year's resolution for covering tech was to spend more time with with entry level and mid ranger phones, like some really good budget options. It, looking back on this year, I don't think I really fulfilled that. And unfortunately, I think I fell into the same trap that a lot of other YouTubers fall into. It's hard to maintain a channel and dedicate the amount of work and effort and analysis and video production and writing and content distribution for a phone that you know isn't going to perform as well on YouTube. And I already focus my channel a lot on devices that are not as SEO popular. I'll make like five videos on an LG and I'll make one video on a Galaxy, you know? So trying to get my hands on more of the two to $400 phones, that's really where I feel the, the, the major excitement is, is building. Um, not, not just for consumers, but for the manufacturers themselves. Again, I want to point to Samsung for as frustrating as um, <coughs> excuse me, for for as frustrating as I find some of their premium game and how disappointed I was in the Note series this year. I don't think anyone would fault Samsung for reinvesting in the A series. Those mid ranger phones are looking so good, and there there are so many good examples. You know, like Motorola had another good mid ranger solution with their G series this year. It's not as exciting. It's not as progressive. It's, it's got good competition now, but that was another solid offering. I mean, I've got it. Do I still have it out? Yeah. Um, I've got a ton of phones on my desk because we're going to be talking about a lot of phones over this podcast, but you know, I've got the T-Mobile variant of the Revel, which is essentially an, another Motorola G series, just reskinned and just how gorgeously nice this phone is from a daily driver perspective. Um, so if you really had to, to, to put me on the spot, and given that I spent most of my year with some of the most expensive phones in, in, on the market today, I would say that the, the phone for me, which it's not the best phone of the year, it, it's not the top phone of 2019, but I think it's probably one of the most important devices of 2019 uh, would be the Pixel 3a. So I've got this this little bad boy right here. Um, this this phone absolutely redefined the price performance conversation for most of my family. <laughs> I just saw a bunch of people. Kyle Ruggles, Pixel 3a, a DT, no, Pixel 3a. <laughs> here in the United States, and, and I've said this so many times before, and, and you guys know I'm repeating myself here. Um, this, this, this phone completely redefined the North American conversation for what you should expect from a mid-ranger phone. Um, obviously, if you're an enthusiast, you've been checking out devices like One Pluses and sort of that flavor of a premium mid-ranger or a, or a low-cost flagship, blah, 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 whatever terminology we want to use. But those devices have still been difficult to join the conversation for my less tech-enthusiast family members. You know, my, my sister and her husband need smartphones but they don't they don't care about most of the bells and whistles they're very pragmatic uh, you know it's we make phone calls i kind of surf some social media occasionally i need an okay camera showing them getting getting to actually like put one of these phones in their hands completely destigmatized the $400 and under category because i, I <laughs> excuse me I put a Pixel 3a in my mom's hand, and in her other hand is a OnePlus 6T. And for what she does on her phone, she couldn't detect those differences in performance. And the Pixel 3a has a better camera. So she still loves her, her OnePlus 6T. It's still a great phone. Premium, screen's a little bit nicer, screen's a little bit bigger. Um, it, it, it's a snappy, fast device. But she also kind of has that feeling like, oh, 
but I do like the camera <laughs> on that cheaper phone a little bit better. So even when it launched at full price, $400 for the smaller Pixel 3a, and, and obviously we can all agree, like the Pixel 3a XL is in a price territory where it's a bit more difficult of a an outright recommendation. But even at $400, the user experience on that little Pixel 3a has been phenomenal. And that's really one of the trends I hope we see continue in 2020. Not necessarily just, well, we'll obviously be getting a Pixel 4a and it's going to have a, a hole punch camera for the, for the selfie. I don't really care about all that. What I really care about is trying to get the message across that consumers should not be defaulting to $1,000 plus premium devices. I had a couple chats with some cousins. Like all, like I had three cousins all need to replace iPhones at the same time, and they were so programmed to getting the nice one because they wanted it to last longer that they all ended up with iPhone 11 Pros. We're talking $1,200 devices, and they kind of take a couple photos and they surf Facebook. And I just, I, I don't feel like that's the way forward. You know, like I couldn't even get them to seriously consider the iPhone 11 because they don't want the cheaper phone. They want to make sure that they get a phone that lasts. Like, you know, she, one of my cousins came from an iPhone 8, so she needs to know that it's going to last as long as, you know, the, the three years. And that's what I find so disheartening when I talk about a Samsung or I talk about an Apple because the messaging is so heavy on those most expensive phones where they make the most money. And then the carriers double down. Because carriers get to sell you zero interest loans. You, they keep you on contract. They get you paying 40 bucks a month for 30 months. But that's not really the phone that person needed. The phone that person needed was probably $300. But you know what? It's only 40 bucks a month. I mean, you can do 40 bucks a month, right? So I, I, I'm, um, I'm increasingly looking to see, like, I need to spend some some more time with Samsung A series. Uh, I'm really hoping the Pixel 4a is a solid buy, and I need to find good options that can play in the North American space, where sure, you can import Xiaomi and Oppo and and all of these like sub brands. I can't recommend that to an aunt or an uncle. Buy this unlocked phone, pop in a SIM card, you get zero support from your carrier. I'm I'm really hoping to find better more and better options that are a little bit more plug and play and and work well with carriers. So that if they show up to a carrier store with a Xiaomi, will they still be able to get support if that person doesn't know the menu structure on a Xiaomi and they can't even hard reset it or something? That 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 to me is is sort of the last link of the chain. The Pixel 3a eliminates that. So even though it's a little bit more expensive for the guts that you get, getting first-party Google software support, day one, Android 10 updates, and if my sister, her husband, my brother's probably going to end up with a Pixel 4a uh, this year. He walks into a carrier store, they're going to know what to do with it, you know? So that, that to me is, is, is the last part of this. The phone is a commodity. I feel like all of us sort of have the sense that the smartphone market is dead as the exciting, hot, disruptive new tech. It's a commodity. We all need to have a pocket computer. So now let's make sure that we're recommending the right pocket computer for someone's budget and someone's needs. I don't think that, well, you just get, you just get the most expensive iPhone, you'll be fine, is good advice. Oh, get the Galaxy S10. You, know, you want to make sure that you've got all this horsepower and you've got those cameras and you know, like, you know, you'll be getting good software support. That's not really what that person needs, though. <laughs> you know, it's like you're going to overbuy so much and never really fulfill what that phone is capable of. Also, that you can open an app a fraction of a second faster doesn't seem to me to be a healthy way to talk about tech and to me it would it would, it feels like that's a surefire way to guarantee that general consumers don't take us seriously as enthusiasts. I feel like they already don't. 
we get into some of those bigger topics and those political issues and you know some of the privacy uh, discussions, I, I don't think they turn to us anymore. And I'd like to get some of that back because we do know what we're talking about. It's just sometimes we get caught up in the excitement and some of the hype. So 2020 is going to be a good reflective year for me coming back, I think. From Fat Produce One, I get the feeling that you are also your family's technology specialist. <laughs> I, I, I told this story um, uh, a, a couple months back, but when my grandfather passed, we had my mom, my dad, my sister, her husband, my brother, and a cousin all in our house. Um, it, it was sort of one of those things where the the, the funeral and the uh, the the accommodations were a bit quick, and you know we were all kind of hurting, and I felt like it's going to be tight, it's going to be snug, but we could all spend this time together. And, and I think that would be better for our family. Um, the day after his, his, uh, his uh, funeral, I had my, <coughs> had my sister and her husband both wanted to buy new, new headphones. It was so much fun getting them to listen through about half of my headphone collection. Here are my Bear Dynamics. Here are my Sennheisers. Here's an Audio Technica. Here are these different types of earbuds. You want to go true wireless? Here's the One Mores and the Creatives and uh, <coughs> the Helm True True TW5. Be, being the family tech specialist is really exciting when you actually get. You know, my my office is is like a Best Buy vomited all over a nine by nine room. Having having that at my disposal, I'll never be more grateful for being in the position that I am because like I wouldn't be able to show them. I wouldn't be able to show my mom a four hundred dollar pixel performs as well for what she does as her one plus six T. I wouldn't be able to show my sister like, you know, here's a pixel three A. Take a photo of this black dog. Look at how well that came out. Now, you have a black cat at home. You've never gotten a good photo of your cat. Wouldn't that be a cool thing to have on a phone which is going to cost half of what a Galaxy S10 costs? So that kind of stuff, I mean, it's 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 priceless. It, we use that word. I, I genuinely mean it. Like, I cannot affix a price to that. I am so grateful to be able to offer that to the people in my social circles. And I don't feel like I get to do it enough. Like, I'd love to have family around more often. Like, again, heading off my cousins who needed iPhone 11s but we're talked into upgrading to iPhone 11 Pros. They're not doing anything on those phones where the again for the Pro Maxes $1,250 plus Apple Care plus tax. They'll never never fulfill. They'll never get a return on that investment. <laughs> like the bang for that buck. <clears throat> Goran Petrovic, poor one. Everyone wants great phones, but cheap ones or iPhones. Um, from Vazicos eight, and you see, this is a this is a a healthy part of this debate when we're talking about this year. I know the U.S. market is different, but when a non techie friend I'm having, oh, I, I think you saying, but when a non techie friend is asking, but when a non techie friend I'm having a hard time recommending a Pixel three A when an LG G seven is cheaper. And that's always going to be the perpetual debate. Do you go with uh, a mid-ranger phone from this year? Excuse me. Or do you go with um, a discounted premium phone from last year? And there isn't a right answer. Um, I have my feelings on it, but increasingly that's a per-user kind of situation. So I look at my sister and her husband. They care about security. They care about software support. Um they want better longer term support than what they got on their Moto. She had a Moto G4 and she replaced it this year with a Pixel 3a. <clears throat> For all the things that they cared about and the auto mode camera, because they're very casual camera shooters and LG G7 isn't the right fit. They would have appreciated having a better headphone jack because they do both have wireless and wired headphones that they like. And they're listening to a lot of stuff on vinyl. 
Um, but for what they carry in their pockets, it's more important for I think it's more important for them to have the best auto mode shooter that they can get and to get the best software support that they can get. And that would have been roughly the same price as an LG G7 versus that Pixel 3a. For them, I think the Pixel 3a is the better fit. Those are the kinds of conversations we really need to have at a granular level instead of just the sort of YouTube SEO version of this conversation where I'll recommend the phone that gets me the most video hits because I feel like that's that's bad for the future of our industry. <laughs> Aditi Anil, an iPhone 11 Pro Max. So you can use the Instagram and swipe faster on the Tinders. <laughs> oh, it's sad, but it's true. <coughs> Excuse me. That was a good one. I really felt like I got some stuff out there. Boing bite. Next time there, drown them with headphones. I think it was overkill. I think it was overkill when we did the round robin. But it was like, we're going to be thorough. And you're also going to consider fit. Because that's another thing that's really hard to uh, describe when you're helping people pick something like headphones. You know, like the ear cups on my um, on my Bear, Dyna Bear Dynamic Lagoons are a little snug for me. They're still comfy, but they don't fit as as luxuriously as like my 770s. And they're just a little tighter than like my Sennheiser um, 599s. You know, like those little differences can make the difference, th those little uh, differences can can mean a comfortable experience or a fatiguing experience. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Matt Tyler. My eldest Lydia just said, Juan is right. Why are people so stupid? I'm happy with phone that plays music I can watch videos on and takes pictures. Why do you need more unless you create content? Proud Papa. Good job. And Kyle Ruggles, there's also being a part of the pack. I have the best iPhone. I'm awesome. I really do think a small part of that for my cousins was the rat race, was keeping up with the Joneses. And again, I want us to get away from that. I want us to take pride in getting the right fit product for us and not, I have to show off that I have the latest and greatest because, you know, like the differences, be, for them, the differences between an iPhone 11 and an iPhone 11 Pro are negligible. I'm still really disappointed that Apple has crappier antennas on the iPhone 11 when the iPhone 11 Pro modem is already an Intel uh, poorer performer than a lot of the Qualcomm kit. But, you know, like, if that's the major difference for someone like them, I don't think they that would have been a pain point at all. They would have ever noticed that it was an issue with how they use it. <clears throat> <laughs> from Sam. And I need a Note 10, even when the Note 9 is baller and has more consumer-needed features like a headphone jack. <laughs> from Rosted. It's funny how a headphone jack is now a feature. So we were looking through. Um, the Pixel 4a leaked, and it has a rear-mounted fingerprint sensor, and just like the Pixel 3a has a rear-mounted fingerprint sensor. It's still better. No, no one can show me where an in-display fingerprint sensor is is even up to the same experience currently as a rear fingerprint uh, rear fingerprint sensor. So it's funny that like to have the convenience of a headphone jack and the better biometric security option, apparently that's for poor people. Rich people like to be inconvenienced with their super premium <laughs> gadget purchases in not having a headphone jack and uh, not having a rear fingerprint sensor. From Kyle Ruggles, diversity is awesome, but then fragmentation sucks. Can't have our cake and eat it too. It's all pros and cons, even with Apple. Look at the various, you know, like the permutations of um, the iPhone 8 series to the iPhone 10 series to the iPhone 11 series, all of the various flavors of iPad. They're one manufacturer and they're supporting two different mobile operating systems and what, a dozen now? 12 different form factors of app-based operating system device. And that's from one company, you know? Like, Samsung obviously you know, blows a lot of people away. BBK as an umbrella corporation obviously has a bunch of smaller brands. Um, but Apple is supposed to be the, 
we make that one product that's better than everyone else, and they still sell way more stuff than I think they need to. <laughs> so get, getting back to it, um, 2019 was a fun gadget review year. I let myself down because I wanted to spend more time with less expensive devices. And and again, that's going to be my New Year's resolution for 2020 again, is trying to use what little platform I have. Um, I, don't, I don't think I lost any subscribers in the last YouTube purge, so I'm still over 100,000 subscribers. <clears throat> trying to use that little base of a platform to talk more about other options and and ways to get more use out of your out of your phone because the 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 conversation is never i don't think thousand dollar phones shouldn't exist but when you buy a super premium thousand dollar phone i feel like we need to have a different conversation about what that thing offers uh, you know if you're reviewing an LG V50 in the same way that you review a Motorola G8 then you're completely missing the point on why those two different products exist. Especially as we get into an even more mobile-focused future, as we get into uh, more augmented reality and more portable computing, and phones are increasingly going to chip away at the laptop market. We're going to blur the line. Microsoft is going to blur the lines with Surface products that are even more foldable and flexible um, we know that more mini tablets are coming and more tiny expandable phones are coming. As we, as we start making that push, it is increasingly important to, to take that, re that look, to, to have that more nuanced conversation. <coughs> There's always going to be a segment of our society that they need to make phone calls, text messages, and they do a little bit of light social media and they kind of need a camera. That experience is fulfilled at $300 or less. That's the truth of where we are now with entry to mid-range. That's a very good experience at $300. So climbing above that, we should expect the needs of that consumer to rise sort of as a corollary with the price. So when we get to that $1,300 iPhone, what are you doing that requires $1,300 worth of pocket computer? And then you can make a smarter purchasing decision. You can make a more responsible purchasing decision. You hopefully get more life out of that, you know, that dollar spent um, and have it be more appropriately focused to what it is that you need to accomplish during your daily mobile computing habits. <clears throat> <laughs> There's a whole conversation going off about um, in-display versus uh, face unlock. Um, again, uh, different strokes for different folks. But um, but uh, I still feel the uh, for, for an on-the-go device, the absolute best solution is a rear-mounted fingerprint sensor. And, you know, like, I, I, I pick up a – where is my Pixel 4? is way over there. So I'm just going to dummy it with my Pixel 3. Like you pick up for a face unlock and it's such a much more deliberate aiming gesture than when I'm pulling a phone out of a pocket and my finger just naturally rests on the back of the phone and the phone is open and unlocked and ready to use. It's always faster on a fingerprint sensor, especially a rear mounted fingerprint sensor for how I hold and use my phones. Face unlock on the Pixel 4 is better. I like that the radar is activating the screen, but I still then need to flick it and make it scan, and it's always a beat. It's always an extra step, an extra split second before it finally kicks over on unlocks. And I don't know, maybe it's something with my face or my sunglasses or something like that. It fails more frequently than my rear-mounted fingerprint sensors. So it's not often, it's not common, but I have to put in my pin more frequently on any face unlock device than I do with any fingerprint sensor device. So that's enough. That's enough for me to go, ah, it's, that's not for me. This is not my bag. I, if, if given the choice, I will take rear fingerprint sensor every day of the week and twice on Sunday. 
A DT Anil rear mounted fingerprint sensor. Oh, you mean peasant tech. <laughs> I, I like I like peasant food. I'm from New Mexico. We make bomb, big old fat, saucy meals, but they are not fancy. And uh, apparently I'm the same way with technology. <laughs> And for Sam's point too, the LG G8X, great phone. It was a stonking good buy when it was on sale. $700, dual screen phone, flagship specs, in-display fingerprint sensor is practical considering the dual screen. Not as good. Not as good as the rear-mounted sensors that they've used. So, um, <laughs> oh, gross. <coughs> People talking about blood authentication. Apparently someone watched Gattaca recently. But uh, yeah, living with a... Um, uh, you know, some some blood sugar issues and stuff. I, I don't know that I want a diabetic protocol for unlocking my phone. <laughs> so uh, 2019, I think the phone that held my SIM card the longest was the LG G8. Um, it's not, I, it, you, I genuinely don't believe there was a best phone of the year, but that was the phone that I think kind of resonated and I stuck with the longest. It's right over here. <clears throat> this is the phone that kind of did it for me. And and for you know a good chunk of the country and a good chunk of the world, this was maybe the only LG you had access to because the V50 launch was very disrupted because of that 5G radio. But yeah, so the the G8 was was pretty much my jam. Um uh SIM card is still in the Pixel 4 XL, but I think I'm going to have to switch that out this week. Um, I have a couple other things that I need to review, and I'm swapping it back and forth with the iPhone 11 Pro a lot. <coughs> and uh, once I'm done with the iPhone 11 Pro, and uh, check out the YouTube tech guy. Ricky has my LG G8X. We're doing a, a trade, and we're going to do a little like wrap-up video when we're both done, just kind of sharing our thoughts on using two different phones. Um I think when I'm done, I, I think I might go back to the to the G8 until we get new phones in 2020. Um, it's just so familiar, and I like the headphone jack, and I like the camera controls. Everything is just a bit more immediate. Um, I'm I'm more familiar with it, so it feels comfier to me. I think that'll probably be the gig. Um, oh, everyone, give uh, Matt Tyler an F in chat. ROG Phone Two held my SIM and my heart the longest. Saying goodbye to it yesterday killed me. A moment's silence for a fallen brother. Hmm. From Noob Master, from, from Noob Master, 2020 may be the year LG does away with the headphone jack. Um, very possible. I don't know. We'll have to see. When we get um, this next generation G series, there are rumors that the V60 could launch really early. Um, maybe around MWC early, or at least be announced um, at MWC. I'm very nervous. I, I think every other company, once Samsung does it, every other company is looking at Samsung and Apple and how they make a ton of money off of inconveniencing consumers. And I think they're, the rest are going to follow suit too. Um, LG already has a great infrastructure for wireless audio. LG Tone, LG Earbuds, um, they're a known space in Bluetooth audio, so they can easily package and combine and offer deals and do all those things that Samsung did with the Galaxy Buds. <clears throat> so this could be it. I, I really hope it's not. I hope 2020 is the last year they keep, or at least that they keep the headphone jack for another year. I hope I would hope LG would keep the headphone jack forever. Um, but, but I think the writing is on the wall that it's too profitable to break your phone and then charge consumers to fix what you broke. And you know, and again, once Apple makes money on it, every other manufacturer is going to start salivating at the idea of more accessory up purchases and accessories that need to re be replaced more often and you know, uh, other little gadgets and chargers and cables and oh, even replacement ear tips, we'll get to charge them for that. I think that's that's unfortunately the the future of the premium smartphone market because the premium smartphone is such a commodity now. How do we squeeze a bit more profitability out of that? So I think 2020 will be that trend. <clears throat> uh, 
Oh, and someone else was asking. I think it was Vasikos. I apologize if I got that wrong, but um, I I am so so. Twenty twenty is going to be a year of talking about audio tech and hearing health. The hashtag is twenty twenty hearing, like twenty twenty vision. I think that's kind of a fun little pun. It's the year twenty twenty and. <coughs> going to be a lot of 2020 vision jokes. So I want to talk about hearing health and audio products a bit more aggressively. So I am going to be looking to do things like try and dig up a few more USB DACs. How do you improve audio on a phone that doesn't have a headphone jack? Um, there's, there's going to be a lot of that because I don't think we can, we can still fully cut the cord. Um, Bluetooth is good. It's convenient. I have a ton of Bluetooth headphones. But there are so many times, like one of the main reasons why I want to go back to the G8 after I'm done with my SIM card in the Pixel 4 is it's so inconvenient. It is such a huge pain point when you want to use cabled headphones and trying to dig up one of those stupid dongles and keep it all attached. And I I drive around in Los Angeles a lot where I'm charging my phone on the car, on a car charger. And I can't do that when something else is plugged into the phone. I mean, it's just... It's such a pain, and it doesn't need to be a pain, but it's a pain because they make more money off of making that pain. So, <clears throat> um, so I think that that's that's got to happen. Um, other USB audio solutions, other wireless audio solutions, and then how to use them in a way that's better for your hearing health. Um, but I will be trying to dig up a few more. Like I, I reviewed the Fio DAC. Uh, was it the end of last year? Um, was it early this year? I can't even remember. But there got to be a few more options like that, just so consumers have something to point to. Where if you care about this stuff, you care about you already own nice headphones, and you don't want to have to buy Bluetooth for everything. That this could be a solution for that. Uh, Kyle Ruggles, any thoughts on the iPhone 12 or whatever completely getting rid of the ports? Um, so yeah, like. I think we're pretty confident that the iPhone in 2020 will be some sort of iPhone 11 S. Um, Samsung threw me a curveball because, you know, the next Galaxy would have been the Galaxy S11. And that's super annoying where you've got S11 versus 11 S. So now Samsung's going to be better than Apple by being a Galaxy S20, I guess. I don't know. Um, by the time we get to 2021, there are rumors that Apple's going to get rid of all the ports. And it's still going to sell great because it's an iPhone and they've got a, a locked up market. There's very little consumer drift where people who are currently invested in the iOS ecosystem are going to switch to Android because of some kind of inconvenience. They're going to act like it's super futuristic and very courageous and super brave. And it's terrible. It's bad for the consumer. It, it creates more waste. You have to buy tons more accessories and chargers and docks and plates it gets rid of all of the accessories that are functional, barely functional on the lightning connector, <clears throat> but still gives the iPhone more flexibility. And wireless doesn't work for all of the other uses. You can't have an iPhone Pro and then have wireless audio over some kind of Bluetooth standard. Like, it doesn't really work. So it, it, it's, it's going to happen. I don't know that it'll happen in 2021, but it's going to be disappointing and it's going to be sad. That's a bummer. <clears throat> ah. From Rostate, if LG keeps the headphone jack, some people may choose them over Samsung. Maybe, Shrug? I, actually, the, Samsung did the same thing. Uh, as Apple. So for as much as Samsung likes to make fun of Apple, they copy every single Apple business move. And so when they got rid of the headphone jack on the Note, and they offered sort of a lower tier Note 10 at $950, it didn't really seem to impact their sales projections at all. And it probably increased the number of accessory purchases when that Note launched. <clears throat> Everyone who's sort of brand affiliated if it's Apple or if it's Samsung, we'll look at other devices and then rationalize why they still need to stick with the company that they're familiar with. I get my cousins with the iPhone 11 Pros, uh, kind of a good example of that. I, I get spoiled because my 
my my family, my my parents and my my siblings just don't care. The, the none of them are fashion brand label types of people. Um, like the the fancy brand in most of my family is Kirkland because we all really like Costco and we like supporting Costco's business model. So like that's a that's a nice label for us. Um, so it was an easy conversation to get my sister off of Motorola and onto Google, you know, like that's cake. That, that's, that's not a, a hard conversation. It's not a difficult transition. My mom was on a Galaxy S5 and I put a OnePlus 6T in her hands and she went, oh yeah, this is nicer than my phone. Oh, and it's how much? Well, that's, that's a lot cheaper than a new Galaxy. I'll try this phone. And she loves it. She's a little, like I said, she she kind of maybe wants to switch to a Pixel for the camera, but she's digging the phone. The, the OnePlus 6T is is ridiculous powerful overkill for what she needs to do. And she got it for cheap. <clears throat> so I, I get, you know, my my family perspective is a little bit skewed there. But I, I seriously doubt anyone's going to seriously talk about LG, especially in the tech enthusiast circles, um, how many times we've seen articles, videos, or even just tweets? Oh, LG is a dead company. They can't just they can't do anything to turn it around, and completely ignoring the actual products, but talking about like the philosophy of the company is this major failure, and that's what we're going to see more of. <clears throat> it doesn't matter if LG puts out a great competitive product. 10% cheaper than a comparable Galaxy, has extra features that a Galaxy doesn't have. Samsung fans will look at those differences and then go, oh, but what I really need is on the Samsung. And it's, it's the reason why marketing works. It's the reason why that brand identity and emotional connectivity works. It's not the the rational decision-making that we think it is. It's part rational, but very heavily skewed emotional. And... That's why this whole market is not as fun to talk about. I spent this whole year celebrating all of these other devices that I had genuinely good experiences with only to then have, you know, a third to half of all of the comments that I got either, you know, just get blocked because they were abusive or be from Samsung shills going, oh, are you really saying you recommend this over Galaxy? You know, like, yeah. <laughs> for the right consumer, yes, that's the conversation we should have. Um, it, it's it's not the the feature set and you know a one to one comparison of pros and cons. Um, from Nabong, uh, thoughts on phones getting higher refresh rate displays in twenty twenty. Um, yeah, I mean it's a foregone conclusion. Uh, Qualcomm's uh, recent tech summit, the the Snapdragon eight sixty five, is right around the corner. It's going to have better support for higher refresh rate displays, uh, not not only 90 and 120 hertz, but you know potentially even faster than that. It's a nice perk. It's frustrating because I've been a fan since the Razer 2. I never really did get to go hands-on with the Razer 1, but the Razer 2, 120 hertz refresh rate display, it's so crisp, it's so slick, obviously comes with a battery hit. And this year, we, we got it again. The, the Pixel with a 90 hertz display, the OnePlus phones with 90, variable rate 90 hertz displays, the ROG with that 120 hertz display. And obviously, they were a step ahead because the Snapdragon 855 didn't support that feature directly with, with good you know sort of hardware component support. But the battery penalty for that wasn't a deal breaker. It was a 10% range of battery usage that a grown-up could make that decision on fuel efficiency versus hot rod performance. And I like having the option. I'd rather have the option to turn up the eye candy when I want to and then turn it off when I don't have to. But think about how many times we saw tech reviewers say things like, well, I mean, if the only way you can get better battery life is to turn it off, then it's, it's not even worth having. Which makes zero sense. But that's, that's what passes for tech reviewing these days. That's tech commentary. You only say that when you're trying to make a Samsung or an Apple user feel better about owning a Samsung or an iPhone. 
because you know that they're a bigger audience and you know that you get more hits from them. So if you piss them off too much, you won't get as much traffic. You say nice things about OnePlus's display and you don't bring up that there's a minor battery hit to that. Oh, you're a OnePlus shill and I'm not going to come back to your blog anymore because I own a Galaxy and I made the right choice with my purchasing dollars and I know what, you know, what what is the best phone on the market because that's what I bought because it's a meritocracy and I would buy another phone if it were really the best phone but because I bought this phone it's the best that that's the game but next year Samsung Apple they'll probably drop off 90 hertz 120 hertz something it's it's in the ecosystem now so they, they're gonna move on it and then It'll be a little bit better thanks to the Snapdragon 865. I bet it's still going to come with some kind of battery penalty, but maybe we whittle it down from a 10% battery hit to a 5% battery hit. Well, now it's the right time. Now it's worth it. Now that Samsung did it, oh, now it's worth it for the money. And anyone who doesn't have 90 hertz, well, that's a deal breaker. And, and I'm tired of playing that game. It's obvious. It's a lowest common denominator metrics and seo kind of game it's not shilling but it's playing the popularity angle and again it forces you to punch down on smaller companies that are genuinely doing exciting things all so that you can support the largest audience the largest base for your own metrics analytics and and you know uh, channel health mm-hmm <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure if you're joking or not, Rosted, but Juan, the iPhone Pro has the M1 chip and the animation for the Bluetooth. Powerless makes sense. I I if you can connect a microphone to any of that and still have the bandwidth for high quality recording on a pro phone, maybe. I'd take that more seriously, but a completely portless iPhone makes zero sense to me, especially if you're going to call it a pro. (coughs) Uh, From Kyle Ruggles. And see, Kyle and I have been having this conversation, what, like four years now, Kyle? I'm waiting for over-the-air wireless charging to become a thing. Pop a battery pack in your bag and power your phone for however long you want. I I mean it's like I mean we've been we've been talking about that as future tech for I mean we're living in the future from when Kyle and I first started having these conversations Kyle and I have been chatting long well into the early run of the board at work podcast way back in the day and we were talking about it then like this is going to be the magical future tech that's right around the corner and it's still the magical future tech that's right around the corner I, I just I know I'm old and I know I'm cranky and I'm that guy who's wagging my fist at kids to get off my lawn. But cables are always the best. You're gaming. You can game over Wi-Fi. But if you're gaming seriously and you're trying to reduce lag and you're trying to maximize the gaming experience, Ethernet is better than Wi-Fi, um, especially for me. Like I'm uploading videos. I need the fastest and most stable upload connection that I can have. And that means using a cable, plugging into a, directly into my router. That's always going to be better. You want the safest, fastest, or smartest power connection. Like, I, again, looking at the work that LG and Sony are doing on these optimized charging uh, settings. So you can set a window where your phone charges fast, or you can also force the phone to charge slow to preserve battery health. All of that stuff is is easier, is more immediate, and is safer over a cable. And we'll get there. We'll eventually have some sort of passive fog of wireless power at some point. Um, but again, it's it's still in the theoretical consumer space. Eventually we'll get it. It's some kind of cool future tech. No time frame. I don't think it's coming next year. <laughs> <coughs> But it has. Yeah, he's saying, imagine when we get to this point. We've been talking about that for about four years. It has been. It's been four or five years that Kyle and I have been talking about in the air wireless charging. 
Uh, it's hilarious. So um, <clears throat> uh, I still want to take just one second here. Uh, this is well past the mid-show. Uh, kind of done talking about 2019. Um, and a few things, you know, uh, someone asked, uh, what is it? Dank pick min God. Uh, I'm, cause I'm kind of looking through my live chat here. What are your predictions for the LG V60? Can you repeat that question just a little bit later? I want to spend just a little time talking about the subreddit. And then I also want to talk about the last 10 years. Um, you know, maybe a good 15 minutes here and there, just how things have changed. Cause it, it's been an incredible from t 2010 to 2020, what we take for granted today is is kind of awesome. So uh, real quick, I have a lot of criticisms for the current state of content creation, production, distribution, YouTube, podcasting, et cetera, et cetera. I, I do just want to bring this back up, clicking into uh, my screen share. Um, this podcast has a subreddit. The subreddit is reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. My podcast subreddit is not about me. Sometimes I'm on my subreddit, and sometimes people talk to me on my subreddit, but I really want to continue celebrating the discovery of new channels and promoting content which deserves more attention than what YouTube's algorithm can deliver. So reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. These are the top stories of the last week, and I'm so excited Top story with, with I mean, a, a good chunk of upvotes for such a small subreddit is from Gadget Byte, looking at the best mobile gimbals to buy. You know, I was just talking about, you've got this really fancy premium phone. What are you doing with it? How can you get the most out of it? An accessory like a gimbal, if you're interested in creating video, is such a handy gadget. And I love the production style that Gadget Byte uses for their videos and their reviews. So they look at a bunch of gimbals and they talk about which one might be the best option or the best fit for you. These are so much fun. And this video is a really fresh look at how to get this type of feature cost effectively. <coughs> Moving right along in the number two spot, uh, I will not lay claim to a best phone of the year. But Painfully Honest Tech did, and Jason over at Painfully Honest Tech named the LG V50 the best phone of 2019. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to fight him on that because you guys know how I feel about LG phones and having the best audio experience for headphones and the best built-in camera controls. Um, from a content production standpoint, there is no device that can stand toe-to-toe with a V-series phone. And Jason seems to be backing that up. So you can catch his his look at the LG V50, the second highest voted um, art uh, article on the subreddit. And then wrapping up the third spot, LFA Reviews, my boy LFA. And I'm going to be talking to him a lot in 2020 because I want him on board my hearing health initiative because uh, you need to subscribe to his channel if you care at all about your ears. If... You absolutely hate your ears and you don't care about keeping them healthy and you're happy to go deaf and then eventually spend thousands of dollars on, on hearing aids, don't subscribe to LFA's channel. You don't need to. It's fine. You hate your ears. Totally cool. You don't need to watch his videos. If you in any way enjoy your biology and being able to hear sound around you and you're looking for good solutions to feed your ears, good audio, then you absolutely need to be subscribed to his channel. <laughs> <clears throat> LFA Re Reviews is looking at the KZ-S1. This is from KZ. I love KZ as a manufacturer. They make some of the these amazing low-cost in-ear monitors, and now they have a hybrid true wireless earbud, which means it's... Pro I haven't seen the video yet, but I would imagine that it's a dynamic driver and a balanced arm. So two elements in the earbud to generate sound, which is a nice step up over the current trend of single driver true wireless earbuds. I mean, we're in an arms race right now. <clears throat> now I've got um, five driver earbuds. I've got eight driver earbuds. I mean, it gets kind of silly when you start just packing in tons of hardware like that. 
But dual driver is this nice sweet spot where you can fill in more bass and still have crisp articulation in the mids and highs. So if KZ is able to do that in true wireless, that's a nice step up for the true wireless market. And something tells me they won't be prohibitively expensive because KZ multi-drivers are usually 40 bucks or less, which is insane performance for the price. <clears throat> um, do, 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 and get this out of the way right there. And then I, I just want to say, because like I'm usually not in the top spot, but my Sony A7 review made it to the number four on glowing rectangles. Some dude in a hat telling everybody something that they already know. Oh, this camera's so good. Everyone should like this camera. Yeah, and he's got the most hashtag punchable face in this whole lineup. But that's glowing rectangles. Reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. Um, we pick up a few new members every week. Uh, I, it's it's becoming a really fun place to share new content and then to also find new content. I'm going to put out the plea again. I'm seeing lots of new submissions. We still need your help on upvotes. When something is more popular on one subreddit, it's easier to find on Reddit as a whole. That can really help a content creator find new audience, find new subscribers, get more monetization. If you want to help promote a content creator, Reddit can be a really good place to share their stuff. What I hope my subreddit will become is a feeder subreddit. So if something is popular on glowing rectangles, maybe it makes it to our technology or our Android or our iPhone, one of the really huge front page subreddits. And from there, that could blow someone's channel up. Um, that's the dream. And I need your help for that. We need your help for that. So it's not just, can you drop a link and that's a cool link? Stick around. Click the up arrow a couple of times before you go. All of this will work hand in hand. It's all going to snowball. It's all going to going to help contribute to getting us more content. You want to see cool new tech videos. You want to see fresh new faces. You want to hear fresh new voices in the tech scene. You don't want this to be three mega huge YouTube channels dominating all of the tech discussion. This is one of the ways that you can help. So reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles is my initiative to help that. And I hope you'll check it out. I hope you'll give it a follow or subscribe to the subreddit. And then I hope you'll stick around and participate because there's really good stuff there. <clears throat> if you've never been before, I guarantee you, you will find a content creator you've never seen before and that you'll want to subscribe to, that you'll, you'll dig what they have to say. <clears throat> Uh, oh, wow. Pinchable. I don't know what's going on in the live chat, but uh, someone's going to give me a little cheek pinch there. <clears throat> so um, we, we've talked about 2019 on two podcasts now, uh, two weeks ago and uh, the first half of this show. Um, we've we've kind of strayed a bit. I was going to try and keep this a bit more focused, but some of the things that I, I kind of hope we'll see in 2020 for the smartphone market and how I want to talk about phones in 2020. But I did want to spend a little time. This has been a crazy stretch of 10 years. If I could go back in time and tell 2010 Juan what 2020 was going to look like, I'd, I'd be disappointed that we don't have like flying cars and stuff. Not really, but you know. Um, but I also think I'd be a little bit shocked at where all of these twists and turns have taken me. In 2010, I was working mainly as a casting director uh, for commercial voiceover. And we were a couple months, we were about, what, six? Yeah, we were about five months into producing a movie review show. <clears throat> This was at that Wild West explosion of web series. There was that hard divide, too. Like, podcasting was becoming a thing. RSS and subscription feeds were becoming popular with the, the tech savvy, but they were still really, really small entities. And we saw that huge explosion of potential YouTube competitors. Um, Google Video had just failed, and Google had purchased YouTube 
but you had Blip and Maker and Revision 3. <coughs> the fall of tech TV caused this explosion of um, online video streaming properties and hosted content in shows. And that was the first foray that my me, my best friend, and my wife, the three of us got together and produced a movie review show, Movies You May Have Missed. Um, if you'll pardon this little trip down memory lane... Uh, there are still a few episodes on archive. We've recovered a ton of them. Um, so I'm going to start, I- I'm going to restart uploading them to archive.org. But, you know, this is uh, what I looked like 10 years ago with my buddy Lee. And yeah, I had sort of longer, it was it was sort of a Prince Valiant haircut and sort of a chin length. Not, not a great look for me, but I was already into wearing hats. So uh, th- this was literally the uh, 10 years ago, what I was doing with my buddy was making this episode of Movies You May Have Missed um, to wrap up our holiday season. And so uh, we- we'd talk about movies you might not have seen. So I, you know, I'm excited that aside from some lighter hairs in my beard, I, I don't think I look too much different, but uh, I was definitely a little leaner. <laughs> I gotten a little thicker um as as a dad <laughs> you know sitting around with a um recovering from following following around a toddler I I had no idea at the time that while I obviously didn't stick with media commentary and movie reviewing um that was actually going to be the catalyst for changing the entire course of my career Voiceover casting ended up going into some really weird places with the internet. And the old school model of like, you run a booth and you you uh, audition actors in this booth and then you send those over to uh, um, your, your client and then you make a casting recommendation and then you put an actor in the booth and you record a commercial and then that gets put on TV is now completely different than what it was 10 years ago. Technology has completely changed the landscape of entertainment in that regard. Um, At the same time, I was dabbling with um, moderating forums, and I I was kind of writing a byline on a friend's tech blog occasionally. It was really, really loose stuff. But it would be about two years after that point where I would start tackling tech commentary and tech reviewing in earnest. But it was, it was all started because of this. Um, Movies You May Have Missed at, at its peak was getting around 2 million downloads uh, a week. Um, we were a fairly well-respected show. We were nominated for a couple podcast and web series awards. Um, we, we, we produced for nonstop for three years. I never missed a week uh, reviewing... Just movies we loved that we felt deserved more attention. Kind of, you know, the the spiritual precursor to my subreddit where I, I want to celebrate content creators that I feel deserve more attention. Um, and then we got a big bump. It was like we were two months into the show when Jeff Kanata of the Totally Rad show um, at the time was like, oh, hey, yeah, I just saw this great movie review podcast. You guys should check it out. And our And our subscribers went from like, 500 to like 5,000. I mean, the, the, the impact of that one recommendation uh, completely exploded my desire to continue producing content online. <laughs> Aditya Inel, hashtag some dad bod guy. A little bit, a little bit. I'm a, I'm a little soft. I got some holiday weight. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so where were we 10 years ago? Those of you in the chat, um, cause a lot of you are, are, you know, not, not the, the youngest tech enthusiasts, um, I, I gather, but think back 2008 to 2009, or I should say 2009 to 2010, like what was the phone in your pocket back then? What was, what was the, the cool, fun technology that you were into at that time? <laughs> dank pikmin god i'm seven years old <laughs> oh i apologize for you watching my stream if you're seven because uh, <laughs> we're about to go down uh the path of old guys what talking about tech <laughs> sam is calling out kyle kyle is old af 
<laughs> Kyle, I'm aging like fine wine. Uh, I, you know, again, I'm I'm trying to keep it to fine wine. I'd be happy with aging like bourbon. That'd be that'd be okay too. I'm just trying not to age like milk. Uh, Noob Master, a Nokia C5. That's a good pick. Um, Nintendo Switch. Uh, I, I was still an elementary school student. I am so thankful that I did not grow up in a time where massively powerful pocket computers with amazing cameras were standard issue for kids. I, I am so terrified for my daughter. Um, Fat Produce was wa- rocking a Samsung flip phone, an AT&T Go phone. So I, I dug it out. I did a, a video on this. I, I did a partnership with um, Erica, Erica Griffin, where we were looking back at some old phones. So I was already, in, in 2009, I was already a smartphone nerd. Because um, remember, 10 years ago, if, if you were a fan of this stuff, it wasn't cool yet. The iPhone was just pushing into um, consumer hands. And it was like an exciting thing that consumers were getting an Apple smartphone, which wasn't very smart. <clears throat> the original iPhone was was kind of just a dull feature phone in a prettier shell. But um, in, in 2009, I was still using this bad boy. So this is my Sprint HTC Touch Pro with a 3.2 megapixel camera and a slider QWERTY keyboard. That's a really uh, phenomenal QWERTY keyboard right there. And they even tried to rip off the iPhone, the iPod click dial. So you had a capacitive um, touch circle for the home, for, uh, for this selector button. And you had a bunch of other buttons too. Like you had a home button, a back button, hang up and call buttons, volume rockers, doesn't have a headphone jack. You had to have a, uh, a mini USB dongle if you wanted to listen to uh, cabled headphones, which even back then, that was a pain in the ass. We haven't learned any lessons there. But it also had a VGA screen. So it had twice the resolution of an iPhone. Or at the time, the big fight was Windows versus Palm. So Palm tapped out at half VGA. Well, this was a 2.5-inch display Full 640 by 480. Man, tightest pixel pitch, amazing image clarity. Who could even use all of that resolution in a pocket mini supercomputer? And this was it, man. This this was this was hot stuff uh, from 2008 to 2010. Um, we were just getting those first Google phones. The it was the Motorola Droid launched in 2009. Because I remember a friend of mine got the droid, and that looked like that could be a serious contender to Windows Mobile. Because <laughs> little did I know, Microsoft had no follow-up strategy for Windows Mobile. It, it just They just gutted it and tried to go with the kin, and then they tried to do uh, Windows Phone instead. Goran Petrovic, I wanted the HD2. Damn, I was so jealous when I saw someone with it. I, I still want an HD2 for my collection. Because what we're going to do here is we're going to go through... Some of, some of my timeline of different devices. I have a, a, an, a, an embarrassing museum of smartphones now. And uh, it, it's, a, it's bad news when you're a collector because uh, these things don't really have a lot of value, but they have that emotional value. Like, I don't want to give them up. And I can't sell them because they're not worth anything. Because before that, I mean, before the iPhone, we were messing with stuff like this. So, like, this is my Moto Rocker. This is what a music phone looked like in 2007. 2006, something like that. And my first candy bar was a Nokia. So it was one of the little Sprint Nokias. I think this was the last Nokia that was officially sold uh, through a United States carrier. It was a 3G phone. So it had a 3G connection when the iPhone didn't even have a 3G connection. And I think it had a... What was the camera? I think it was a one megapixel camera. Like that was like a big deal too. But to get photos off of the phone, you had to buy this like ridiculous pop port data connector cable, which never worked. It was flaky, uh, flaky AF, as the hip kids are saying these days. From Aditya Anil, from 2009 to 2010, I think I was using a secondhand Sony Ericsson, the P990i. Ooh, the P990 was such a nice phone, though. 
um, from Steve Q3 Becker. Uh, the Nexus S wasn't out in 2010. I had a cheap LG flip phone that I replaced with. I replaced my LG Chocolate, but I broke. The Chocolate was a great phone. Um, from Boeing Bike, Droid and the HTC Dream. Oh, the Dream was pretty too. Um, Boeing Bike 2011 to 2012 was pretty interesting. I had a Galaxy S. Matt Tyler on a Nokia N95. That's a classic. That's another one. Like I have very few Nokia <coughs> before Microsoft's involvement. The one I really want is um, what is it? The Nokia N8 it was the one. It was the last Symbian Nokia before they switched over to Windows Phone. I want one of those so bad. The camera on that is still so good. Um, uh, and Fat Produce, a Samsung A167, so great. A Boeing by anyone remember the N-Gage? <laughs> the gaming taco phone. So, 2009, I'm not really, I, I'm super heavy into tech, um, but I'm mostly focused on recording equipment, home recording, professional audio, interfaces, USB audio was exploding, um, voiceover was changing rapidly, and I had just gotten out of working at a talent agency, and I was working as a casting director. Getting into Android was kind of interesting. I missed the Droid, so the, those early Verizon Droid Motorola days, I never really did get my hands on one of those. But where I eventually ended up was my very, my very first Android device wasn't HTC. It was a Samsung. And because I was so um, into my little Windows phone, slider keyboard phones, I had the Apache before this one, the 6700, which was a big, fat brick. You can actually see the HTC Apache in uh, early episodes of... Uh, oh, what was that show? Um, Sean Spencer, he solves crimes. He's very sort of perceptive. Uh, Psych. So Psych, you can see one of those old Windows phones. That's how old that show is. Um, but, you know, I, I had the the pre the precursor to this, and then I also had the larger one, but I sold that to, to buy my Samsung Galaxy S, and I stuck with Sprint, because this was the only flavor of the Galaxy S which had a slider keyboard. Every other variant was just a normal Android uh, phone. It was just a normal Android display phone. Sprint was the only one that opted. So the, the epic 4G <laughs> with, with WiMAX <laughs> on Sprint. Um, this phone was baller back in the day. Because I would flick it out and, oh, look. I don't have to waste any of my screen on a touch keyboard when I want keys. Mm, this is so great. And I really did use it. I, lo I loved it. I liked it a lot. Um, but yeah, so this was um, a couple years later. Once this phone came around, it, was, it wasn't even so much the phone. It was the explosion of all of the supporting technology. We were having those fresh conversations about accessories. And I've got an OtterBox case on my slider Samsung keyboard phone. Um, that whole push, that whole rush was exciting and disruptive. That, I, I think, has been the interesting takeaway from 2010 to 2020, how fast this stuff evolved, and, and it became how fast it became ubiquitous, but then also how aggressive the monetization and commercialization of this stuff happened. Um, you know, it, we, we still have those those heavy conversations and debates about different cases and do you have a skin on yours? Do you have a bumper case? Do you have a sleek case? Is yours like a carbon fiber print? I mean, the entire landscape became tech and fashion focused on what you carry in your pocket, defining how you communicate with other people. Um. <laughs> sorry i'm just reading through a few more of these other comments i had a galaxy ace 2 from natacoon god that was torture to use even with custom roms <laughs> that's so sad so i mean i want to take samsung samsung as an example from 2010 to 2020 the clearest victory i think for any manufacturer <clears throat> a 
aside from Apple, was seeing a non-Apple company become more of a lifestyle brand. So in, t- in 2012, 2011, 2012, when this phone came out, the, the Epic 4G, which is a Galaxy S, technically the Galaxy S1, there were five or six different flavors of this phone, depending on the carrier. AT&T had a metal back version. Verizon had a plastic back version. Um, T-Mobile, I think, had a grippy texture version and then also a slightly larger screened version. (coughs) But they were all Galaxy S's, and some of them had different support for different 3G uh, capabilities, like, you know, the full range of HSPA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As Samsung progressed, they were the first company to truly carve out a an audience segment where they didn't have to play the carrier game of making a different variant for every carrier. That becomes this critical victory by the time we get to the Galaxy S3, the Galaxy S4. It was the Galaxy S4. It wasn't the Galaxy S Epic 4G on Sprint and whatever it was called on AT&T and whatever it was called on Verizon, each one having a different name, even though it's the same generation of phone, they were all Galaxy S3s. Done. And, and that was a critical score. That was a big win for Samsung as a manufacturer. So we, we go through this timeline of Samsung as kind of an exciting company. And for me, the, the high point is when we start getting into the no compromises brand. So like, you know, my Note into my Note 4. And by the time we get to the Note 4, I am hardcore, big time, full on Samsung fanboy. This phone still, I think, defines what a smartphone is in my brain. It is everything. Stylus, headphone jack, removable backplate, you know, user accessible battery. The camera module is easy to damage and it's easy to replace. Because you can peel off the back, screen replacements on this phone weren't particularly hazardous or difficult. Um, I, I, it's still in op- regular operation today. I use it as my teleprompter for when I'm shooting videos. I, I have a little cradle for it and it runs my scripts um, for, my, for my teleprompter setup. This phone, if, if it still received software, this hardware would still be functional today, <laughs> which is what's so crazy about how ahead of the curve the Note 4 was when we got to that point. But I mean, it's still fun even going back. I think this is my Note 2, actually, not my Note. Um, but you know, like what we thought was such an enormous device when it launched is just sort of normal. It's a little fat, like it's thick because of the aspect ratio, and it still has some pretty decently sized bezels. But we don't look at this like it's some enormous device anymore. But it, it was insanely comically huge when it first launched. Because at the time, we were still kind of getting out of the idea that phones had to be this sized. Remember, like, all of those Zoolander jokes of, you know, ooh, like, oh, it's, this is phone, but how's your phone so big? My phone is so small, and I've got a Moto Razor, and it's super sleek. So Samsung carries us through all that. But the story of Samsung, I think, is, is also the story of how other companies succeed and fail in this space and how other manufacturers have kind of let us down. From 10, 2010 to 2020, we're doing all these wrap-up videos now. Oh, LG couldn't turn it around, and HTC is a shell, a shadow of its former self. Uh, Motorola is just kind of hanging in there with these sort of mid-ranger Lenovo products that, that don't really feel like classic Motorola days. I really feel that, <coughs> excuse me, the story of this decade and the companies that have risen and fallen all point back to one critical moment in smartphone design. And that's the, the year of the Qualcomm Snapdragon 810. That was the year that broke everyone but Apple and Samsung. I don't think LG has ever recovered. HTC definitely didn't recover. 
Google shifted from the Nexus to the Pixel, ju- got rid of an entire brand name in part to refocus on consumers, but then also to distance the memory of the product that was saddled with the worst chip of the decade. The Snapdragon 810, hold on, I've got it over here. So we were all excited about HTC when they were making M7s. You know, uh, HTC is doing something fresh and exciting and they're using Android 1080p display and a an interesting camera experiment that, that all of our cameras turned purple. Even my M7 camera went purple. Beats audio and stereo speakers, aluminum frame. It's not really very repairable, but this is an exciting entry into the world of smartphone computing. And then we get to the 1M9. And we could overlook a few things like the camera's a little shaky, no image stabilization. The speakers are still very good. The headphone jack is still great. It's a very good headphone jack, even by today's LG standards. Um, it's competitive with the better options we've gotten since Qualcomm has enabled more support for premium audio on their chipsets. But what what burned us? We've got the HTC One M9. We've got the LG G Flex 2. We've got the, the, the Nexus. The Snapdragon, the Snapdragon 810, it ran stupid hot. Performance was terrible when you really started using the phone. Battery life was miserable when you really started using the phone. And a lot of these phones suffered reliability issues. LG with boot looping problems. You still hear people today talking about LG boot loops. But nearly every phone that employed this chipset has had long-term service problems. Nexuses. We're still finishing up all of the class action lawsuits on the Nexus running the the Snapdragon 810 being an unreliable product. And I think HTC managed to avoid some of those legal fallouts just because no one bought the M9. Um, the, The entire story of where we are today, I feel that's that's one of those critical junctures where we made it to that point. And Samsung made it out alive because they had their own chipset. They were they used for the only year in Samsung's uh, distribution history. They used the Exynos for the North American uh, for their North American launch. And Apple obviously doesn't use Qualcomm. They use their own uh, A series processors. So that year we get their refined experiments. Samsung doing sort of curved displays. The ultimate irony is. I have a Galaxy S6, an S6 Active, an <coughs> excuse me, an S6 Edge, and a Note 5. And the only phone from that era that's still functional is the S6, um, uh, the, the, the S6 Plus, uh, the, the, the curved screen S6. All the rest of them have died. All of my LGs and HTCs, totally functional. I have the reverse problem of what everybody else had from that year where all of their Snapdragon 810 stuff boot looped and died and their Samsungs are still going strong. All of my Samsung batteries have died except for this this phone right here, the Galaxy S6 Edge Plus, which is hilarious. Um, In in that right there, that's a a little fake ammo box. Uh, It's a Halo little lunch tote, um, is my Galaxy S6 where the battery has puffed and it's it's bending out the glass in the frame of the phone. And I still want to get that repaired because I have some photos on that that I'd like to recover, but it's scary to handle that phone. Um, the battery is ready to explode and it's in my office. <laughs> Super safe. I've got a fire extinguisher right there. <laughs> the companies that are top of the pack today, the companies that are winning in the smartphone space, not only the popularity contest, spending the most on advertising, um, they all made their rise after the fallout from the Snapdragon 810. More than anything else, the missteps, the slower software updates, weird features, gimmicks, experiments that didn't pan out, the Snapdragon 810 harmed the industry the most. For the decade, the biggest flop came from Qualcomm because they didn't really personally suffer from it. 
every phone that was manufactured still had one of their chips in it. So they profited like crazy. Um, they got to fix their own problem with the Snapdragon 820, which was a, a, a really solid recovery chip the following year. They never really had to suffer the direct consumer fallout that LG, HTC, Google, every other company had to suffer. They got to hide behind. And I feel like that's one of the most critical parts of this discussion. We can sit here and, and, and you, you know all of the reasons why I think LG is suffering in the market. You know, uh, HTC has had issues and problems. <clears throat> More than anything else, that year of phones left a terrible taste in the mouths of consumers. People heard that they were getting better experiences on Samsungs. And the average length of time that someone owns a smartphone is long enough that they weren't willing to take a chance on an LG G6. You know, from G4 to G6, that would have been your update period, right? Nope, my G4 started boot looping, so I can never buy one ever again. Samsung's marketing buffered them against the Note 7 exploding, right? They made the huge dog and pony show, and, and they put up their international consortium of experts to diagnose the problems that went into the Note 7. And for the Note 8, they had that huge mea culpa at the beginning of their keynote and really thanking their fans, like all of their apparatus and, and billions of dollars of marketing. Because that year, the year after the Note 7 exploded, Samsung was, I think, the second highest spender in advertising. And this last year, uh, Samsung beat Procter & Gamble, all of the sub-brands under P Procter & Gamble, for the most spent on advertising uh, in a year. They spend more on advertising than most manufacturers spend on their entire manufacturing, distribution, and advertising departments. You know, more is spent on Samsung advertising than LG spends on their entire smartphone business from R&D to manufacturing, distribution, and advertising. <clears throat> so this, this to me is the, is the critical point to look at. Because after that, after the Snapdragon 810, and we get into the 820, that's when we also see one of the healthiest years of new brand competition. Um, that's where we get phones like uh, the Axon 7. So if we're talking ZTE, which I'm also kind of disappointed. I didn't get my hands on an Axon this year. The, the new Axon Pro looked like a solid mid-ranger, flagshipy competitor. Um, so this is the ZTE Grand S, which is plastic and kind of feels kind of cheap. But it does have the bender window, which I think is interesting that this phone was ahead of the, the Nexus for this kind of design accent, this kind of design implementation. But this is not a device that we really would have considered competitive. Like, you know, it's a Grand S, it's a ZTE, I don't even know what that brand is. It's probably on some kind of MVNO or super cheap kind of device. The year after the, uh, the Snapdragon 810, the year of the Snapdragon 820, we get this bad boy, the Axon 7. This phone all by itself made ZTE. This was $399, had a Quad HD display, a Snapdragon 821, had a decent camera. Like, the camera wasn't the best camera of its year, but it was solid. Stereo speakers, and it still has the loudest amp I've ever heard on a headphone jack, which is on the top of the phone. But I forgot. This was setting the stage for an incredible, an incredibly competitive company and then they had their fallout with their legal issues, and now they're starting to try and come back again. But that year was so rich. We got the Axon 7, the OnePlus 3. Talk about a phenomenal phone from OnePlus. And as a smaller brand, they were able to more nimbly get out of the, the <laughs> ire and the problems of, of Qualcomm's distribution. And then we also had the Honor 8, another 399 phone, which is still, I think one of the most asked about phones I've ever used while reviewing a device. That blue glass laser etch effect is still, I, like I would use that out in public and people would ask me, what case do you have on your iPhone? That's amazing. <laughs> that, that, that year, 
that year was the turnaround year, but think of every brand that's popular today made their big push after Qualcomm literally and figuratively burned the industry with the Snapdragon 810. We, we want to go through some of these here. Um, you know, like where we ended up with LG and kind of forgetting like phones like the G2, which is just a phenomenal exercise in shrinking display bezels and fitting a larger screen into a smaller form factor with a big battery for its time. Getting into the G3, where since the G3 on, I've been shooting UHD video. I've not been slumming it with this terrible 1080p crap. And even for its terrible year, you know, this um, this is my LG V10, which has just been very poorly treated. Like, I've never had a case on it. It's been dropped and kicked and scuffed. I've got, like, knife marks on the bottom here because I had a, um, I, I did a review of a wood panel, an adhesive wood panel, and then to scrape it off right after I was done with the review, I had to like literally shave off part of the, uh, the, the plastic matte finish um, to get it off. This phone has been through the ringer. I've been through, this is its fourth screen protector and it's cracked <laughs> because I've been rough on this phone. And it set the stage for an entire generation, an entire product line of high quality premium audio and super awesome content creation capabilities. Like the camera on this is still kind of competitive when you look at the feature set and uh, the capabilities. And that takes us all the way up to phones like the G8. You know, the, the design um, uh, evolution is pretty clear. So I gotta catch back up with the, uh, get this out of the way here. <coughs> <laughs> Kyle Ruggles, now don't drop your V-series phones today. <laughs> and, and, you know, like, and Google. Google also faced some of those same problems, too. The Nexus 6P, total dog, class action lawsuits. But out of the Nexus 6P, we, you know, into the Nexus 6P, we had phones like, um, this is my Galaxy Nexus. You know, it has that, like, slight curve to the display. Remember, this was like a thing. You had the G Flex and uh, the G4 had the same sort of pre-bent curve. It wasn't flexible, but it was supposed to just kind of line up with your phone a little bit bigger. And I just remember writing articles about how enormous this phone was. The screen is huge. It's a 4.5 inch display. I mean, you got to put it in your pocket. It's so big. Samsung, I mean, this, this is a, a really beautifully manufactured phone. We get to the 6P and not only are there issues, but Google is at that point trying to make a pivot. The Nexus line has always been sort of a low performer. Build is like a developer phone. And they're trying to make a transition to something a bit more consumer, a bit more mainstream. And they've also got to get away from the reviews and the criticisms of the performance on, on the Snapdragon 810. And so they, they pivot over to the Pixel. I don't have a 6P, but I do have... the phone that was supposed to be the Nexus follow-up. Um, so Huawei, you, you make your phone two years in advance. You know, you, when, when we're talking about phones that are going to be released in 2020, they probably started their journey in 2018. And so Huawei got their hands on a Nexus. They were already in discussion and in talks to deliver the follow-up. Huawei actually was going to be the, the ODM, the manufacturer behind whatever Google did after the Nexus. And you can see that in phones like the Nova, which is like a little baby Nexus 6P. This, this was supposed to be it. This was what our, our look at the future of, of Google partnerships was going to look like. But Google didn't want to have another manufacturer's label, brand label on the phone. And Huawei thought that was a deal breaker. So the two companies part ways. And what is a gorgeously manufactured device, this, this was my first experience with the Snapdragon 625. And I was just shocked at how well this phone performed. Um, this is the little Huawei, the little Huawei Nova. And we see some of the design accents, like the little cutout here, the bender window um, around the camera module at the top for antennas and stuff. That got changed up quite a bit when Google switched over to HTC with the, the first Pixel and that glass window thing on the back, which isn't nearly as elegant as what Huawei delivered. 
<clears throat> um, it, it, it's it's interesting to see like that permutation, because Huawei as a company is also one of those strange stories of crazy evolution. So let me let me dig a little here into my into my stack of phones. I'm just going to pull them all over here right now. <clears throat> so I showed you that Nova, and that Nova was the year after the Nexus 6P. But if you remember, Huawei as a brand was kind of a difficult sell in in the sort of the mid mid early days of this decade. Excuse me. This is um, my Huawei P6. So this is supposed to be part of like the more fashion line. You know, the, the P series phones are always the prettier phones, P for pretty. And it's kind of cheap and the, the bevels and screen edges are kind of rough. And the top of the phone is essentially an iPhone 4. And you can kind of see like that's an iPhone 4. But then the bottom is sort of curved for no good reason. It's like rounded off in sort of an awkward way. They have these like there's like a hard rivet right here, which kind of pulls out and is like a pin or something that holds the entire assembly together. And it feels like it fall, it can fall apart on you. This is what passed for a top tier premium Huawei phone in the P6 days. <clears throat> this, this company was not on my radar until we got to the Ascends and the Mate 8. And then the turnaround happened for me on the Mate 9. So we get out of Qualcomm 810 days. Huawei starts making their own processors, the, the Kirin chipset. And then we get to this bad boy. And the Mate 9 is still a beast of a phone. Again, like if we could still get good software support and updates for this kind of stuff, this hardware would still be useful, functional, capable today. But this was a, a crazy phone to spend some time with. And it, and it was this year, it was the, the Mate nine and the lg v20 were like i was I, I could not put those two phones down those two phones were in my pocket all the time um even well into the the next year after <clears throat> but then we get to the next year after and the mate 10 and i really liked the mate 10 i was sad that they gave up the headphone jack because that's always a terrible idea giving up the headphone jack but then this was the year that it, Huawei cratered with all of their legal issues similar to ZTE. This phone was supposed to be on AT&T. <clears throat> that, that relationship fell through. It was going to be sold on a bunch of retailers, but then they faked a bunch of reviews on Best Buy. Um, so Best Buy, <coughs> excuse me. So Best Buy kind of pulled their, their phone from the shelves. Uh, we were in talks at Newegg at the time to talk, to try and do some type of internal promotion and, you know, make a bundle. Like I was actually putting together a new egg web page. You know, here's Juan's top accessories for mobile content creation and using the Mate Mate 10 Pro to to get photos and videos done. And that's when all of this kind of cratered and bottomed out. And now we're in this ridiculous back and forth game, getting into the Mate 20 and the Mate 30, which is just really frustrating. Again, I I, I don't feel like this is a a legal situation being examined in earnest as much as it is just a bunch of people at the top of the food chain chest puffing out and using brands and governments as their own personal grievance machines, which is horrifically frustrating. <clears throat> so I made it through LG. We talked about um, Huawei. Over the, over the 10 years that we were sort of playing with this stuff, Motorola also went through kind of a similar identity shift because they, they got bought out by Google, then they got bought out by Lenovo. But it is interesting. I don't have a lot of Motorola. All of my Motorola stuff had to go back to pocket now. And so I, I flashed it, you know, before we get into smartphones, I've got my Moto Rocker because this is a music phone. Um, but the only Moto old classic moto in my collection is their little communicator on sprint running like android 2 with a qwerty keyboard grossly underpowered processor for its time barely boots up and functions today and then we balance that against the phones that they make in the g series 
where they're indistinguishable from premium phones. And again, this isn't a Moto, but it's the T-Mobile Revel, but it would look just like any other nice phone today. And this is like a $250 phone now. It's under 300, something like that. Because the G8, again, it's you can get great specs and great performance for, for super, super cheap. <clears throat> I think one of the the saddest stories in in this realm of smartphones and evolution, you know, Microsoft made a bunch of big missteps. Uh, actually, no, the two companies. Let's say the two companies that, or the two brand labels that had the roughest time this decade from where they were and helping to create this market, tanking, cratering, and then coming back would be BlackBerry and Nokia. So I already showed off, you know, like this is this is my little Nokia candy bar. I was full in. I, I was ready to go. Switch everything over. Make it my platform. Windows Phone was great. Um, I have almost every Windows Phone. I don't have the 928, but um, this is my Lumia 920. Um, and then into my favorite, which was the Lumia 930. And this phone today still was capable of doing things that were only just now this year starting to surpass in terms of camera and audio quality the display windows phone was naturally a dark theme you know, like we act like that's a big deal on the iphone now and you're like no they made it this way because it was better <laughs> on lumia's the hardware is gorgeous this this like clean sharp uh rectangular design the polycarb material that they made it's not this a uh, cheap plastic like what we used to get on a galaxy s3 it's this really nice finish to it that when you scratched it, it didn't show the scratch because the plastic was that color. It, was, it wasn't just painted that color. So many amazing, amazingly correct, ahead of the curve, design ideas, accents, software ideas. And Microsoft screwed the pooch on consistency, getting these phones out, having yearly updates and not treating it like they did Windows Mobile where it could be three years before you'd get a major update, the smartphone, they, they, they completely missed the boat on what made consumers excited about smartphones. <clears throat> and so we get to, you know, this year, and Nokia is, as a label, is finding a bit of a resurgence. They, they're being licensed by HMD, which is a consortium of former Nokia engineers. Like, the DNA's in place. But that magic just isn't quite there. For as much as I really enjoy the audacity of an experiment like the Nokia 9, and, you know, they switch to Android. Okay, it's Android 1, and you get reasonable operating system updates. This crazy camera experiment on the back of the device. How gorgeously manufactured this phone is. It really should have been a premium crown jewel phone in 2018, and it suffers for having been launched in 2019, and it suffers again for having a few overly ambitious uh, experiments that didn't quite um, pan out. But it's just not the same kind of magic as that first time I picked up a Windows phone, like a Lumia 800, and just like, wow, this is this is different, and this is clean, and this is sleek. And then a Lumia 920, and this camera is awesome. And then a Lumia 930, and this camera is even more awesome. It, just that kind of magic of disruption is kind of gone these days, which is sad. I was hoping we would get it back with a company like BlackBerry, but that's obviously not going to happen. Because we can do the same thing with BlackBerry. Where we were, and you're going to hear, <clears throat> you're going to hear a little bump by the microphone here. You know, um, I, I, I have a curve somewhere. My wife really loved her old classic BlackBerry. You know, we had like the little uh, BlackBerry OS 10, BB OS 10 experiments. I love this as a smaller form factor device. It's a communicator, first and foremost, not a multimedia and entertainment device. We had a crazy beautiful experiment with the Passport. Big, square, chunky. It, it, it's a crazy look, but I, I promise you, when you really used this phone and its super wide flat base and how you type on it and how you can hold it, how everything fit so well for the type of experience that it was offering. Again, not the best multimedia experience, but a solid camera, great specs, great performance. It's just BlackBerry didn't have the oomph to get all of that extra software behind it. 
We were all in that app race. You needed to have 20 different fart apps in your app store or your phone was dead in the water. It was just frustrating. We couldn't get back to browsers. Everything had to be an app. App, 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 app. So BlackBerry makes their transition to Android. And when do they make their transition to Android? Does anyone remember when BlackBerry switched over to Android? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Oh, Aditi Anil. My dad had the passport. It was crazy. Uh, from SD Sakuragi. Yep, it's my personally da personal daily driver, and I love it, but I find it hard to recommend. Uh, Sam's got it. The Priv. So uh, I recently re-added one of these to my collection because uh, I had to give the, my other one back to pocket now back in the day. But this, the BlackBerry Priv, we're going to Android. You, the, the market has spoken. We're going to give up on BlackBerry OS X, which was better built for gesture navigation, was um, more processor efficient, uh, better battery life for the battery sizes and the processing specs. And they did it in the same year that Qualcomm saddled the industry with the Snapdragon 808 and 810. When you used this phone, it ran so hot that you could not charge it and use it at the same time. If it was plugged in, the battery would still deplete if you were just doing basic stuff like replying to emails. It would just deplete a little bit slower. And as it charged, the back of this thing got scary screaming hot because of the abomination of a processor that Qualcomm destroyed the industry with. I still would hope that TCL would look at this and come up with something like this again today. The slider is so fun. And, and I love slider. I mean, you can see I have a ton of keyboard phones. I have a Motorola keyboard phone here. But from Blackberries to Samsung sliders to HTC sliders, it's why I still have such a fond, um, fond reaction for the Key 2. It's, it's out specced today. I, it's, it's getting a little long in the tooth. And BlackBerry support is an interesting beast to discuss because it's not the same as just Android support. There's a lot of BlackBerry juice mixed into this to the setup. But I still, I, there's something so compelling about a communicator phone that you pick this thing up and it's not the best multimedia experience and it's kind of crap for a lot of games outside of like gem swap types of games. But you pick it up and you make phone calls and you text and you email and you instant message and you slack and you do all of that businessy communication stuff or medical communication stuff. And this phone is still the premium premier solution for that, even with specs that are now starting to get on two years out of date. This is what I'd hope that we would see another niche player in 2020. I hope TCL has something to say about the BlackBerry brand as we get into 2020 and 2021. Um, it, it's, it, it's again, it's just a shame that for this phone being as good as it is, this company and this label and this, this brand here, you know, this little logo is just that pale shadow of, it, of its former self. Same thing with Nokia. It's this ghost of its former shelf. HTC hasn't made any noise outside of crypto phones and is, is a completely empty shell of its former self. LG is declining in the market while making some of the best phones they've ever made, but they don't have the leverage to properly distribute all of those phones. And we're only seeing you know, positive growth on those consortium devices like BBK brands, Xiaomi, uh, companies, <coughs> companies like that, where I hope desperately that we'll see a turnaround for Sony. I always have my Xperia XZ1 Compact in arm's reach. And I wish I had some older Sonys to show off too. But going from this and then checking out what Sony was able to do on the Xperia 5. Just a really sweet, fresh take on a tall, skinny candy bar phone which doesn't walk away from Sony DNA. Rectangular, hard-edged, monolith-style devices crazy camera experiments this had the first 960 frame per second burst slow-mo with 3d remember 3d modeling and tracking they're showing that off on the note it doesn't work on samsung's phone it works on the xperia xz1 compact and it works even better on the xperia 5 i don't know how many people really care to be like making 
3D models of toys that they can feed into 3D printers, but you can do it, and you can do it for real on a Sony with other great features and stuff like that. <clears throat> Which, again, that kind of all ties us in and brings us back. Um, the, the company that, in one part, deserves this 10-year conversation and at the same time also deserves a healthy amount of criticism and skepticism, the story of this 10 years seems to also be Apple's story. The, uh, the culmination of, of 11 years of smartphone computing and changing what we expect from a consumer-driven standpoint from the original iPhone launching, what was it, the end of 2008, to getting now to the, uh, to the beginning of, to the end of 2019. I, I, I have this internal conflict with Apple. When I look at the original iPhone, I was very frustrated by the tone of the conversation because the iPhone really seemed to be a prettier, less functional Palm Pilot. Um, Palm OS was going through a rough transition. I mean, those phones were, were having some issues. The Treo was getting gutted. I mean, one trail even ran Windows Mobile. It was a weird time back then. But there was one thing that Palm Software always championed. It was leaner. It was more streamlined. You ran one app at a time. There wasn't really multitasking. It was a big deal when you could play music in the background and open up an email. You know, like that was kind of a big deal for, for Palm OS. But everything about the original iPhone seemed totally cribbed from the, from the palms that we had of that time. You turn the device on, and it's just a row of apps, just like the iPhone. You open one app at a time. The iPhone could only run one app at a time. The iPhone was better for you know, media player. You know, the, the, the music listening, the media player on the iPhone was better than what you had on a Palm Pilot, but it... You know, you, you had the iPod DNA sort of built into that original iPhone key, uh, keynote. And even down into things like the screen resolution, Palm championed that weird half VGA. It's like 320 by 240 or something. No, 320 by 480. And Apple copied that too. Apple made their play on, we're going to get rid of the stylus. So you have a fingertip touch capacitive display, but almost everything else seemed like it was straight out of the Palm playbook. And that was a company that got burned, got bought out by HP. Their, their IP is now being licensed in like LG televisions for uh, WebOS and stuff like that. The Palm Pre was a great um, experiment in what you can do with an alternative operating system that never had the resources to properly compete. <coughs> but that brings us back to Apple where we want to praise them for revolutionizing the smartphone market. And I feel like they made a couple correct decisions. The, the touchscreen was absolutely the critical feature that moved smartphones into a more mainstream audience. But the whole rest of the experience was a huge step back from what portable pocket computers were already capable of doing. Like not even being able to install programs. Palm Pilots could install other programs. You wanted to run TomTom Tom or Garmin software on your, uh, what was it, the T5? You could do it. It wasn't as clean as the experience we have today with a dedicated app store, but you could install cab files on Windows Mobile. You could I don't remember what the executable was for a Palm, but pop in a memory card, run it, install the program, good to go. You have a new program on your phone that you can do things with. I was playing Age of Empires on Windows Mobile and Doom and all of these like PC ports that were coming out for, for uh, Windows CE. And then Apple comes along and everything takes this huge step back. We try and fake it all with web apps on a phone that had a 2G radio. So over that time, obviously, Apple's improved. <laughs> <coughs> but not for without, not, not, not for missing a few um, key steps. They've always struggled with their mid-range solution until this year. I feel like they've got a better handle on what a medium-priced iPhone costs. I mean, if we remember, 
their initial idea was to punish people um, with the iPhone 5C. So this was all about making it obvious that you were cheap. Because what they would do is like, you know, the iPhone 5 would come out and then the iPhone 4S would go on sale. So then the iPhone 5S comes out. And instead of being able to use the same accessories and the same cases as the iPhone 5, they have the iPhone 5C. So everything's different. And it comes in these plastic shell sort of, you know, doofy colors. And it was just this clear advertisement that you bought the cheap iPhone. The iPhone 5C was cheap. And it seemed to solely exist to upsell you to the iPhone 5S. I see you don't really want this one. You want the good one. And that, that indoctrination, that consumer conditioning still seems to exist today. I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, some of my cousins that absolutely do not need $1,300 iPhone 11 Pro Maxes, but they needed to get the good one. And they didn't want to show up with the cheap one. And then you factor in cutting out the headphone jack. It's just terrible. And then you look at some of their plans on making Bluetooth a bit more proprietary. And they still don't support advanced audio codecs because they don't want to license them. Apple doesn't want to give Qualcomm extra money to, to license uh, aptX. And I don't know what the relationship between Apple and Sony is like, but wouldn't it be nice if you had an iPhone and you could use those really nice Sony Bluetooth cans? and get the premium Bluetooth audio quality that LDAC supports, you can't do that on an iPhone. So not only is it more difficult to do audio stuff because you have the lightning connector, you also don't get the best benefits of what Bluetooth really has to offer. And you get to pay the most. <laughs> They're the most expensive devices on the market this year. And Samsung likes to price just under so they can say they're cheaper. You're like, ooh, I saved 50 bucks by getting a Galaxy instead of an iPhone, said no iPhone owner in the history of this Apple-Samsung debate. But for all of that whinging and all of that whining, um, I, I do have to say over these 10 years, the, the, the one experience that I can take away from Apple is how much I've absolutely loved the iPhone SE. So after the iPhone 5S and into the iPhone 6S, so we went from the iPhone 5S to the iPhone 6 to the iPhone 6S, Apple saw that there was still a market for a smaller, nice phone. This was their mid-ranger, but it had the same specs as their nice phone. It has the same processor and the same camera as the iPhone 6S, but still has the headphone jack. So when we get to the iPhone 7, the iPhone SE was still a better phone just because headphone jack because that's, that's who I am. <laughs> but this to me is, is the final execution of the Steve Jobs inspired mobile computing experience. This phone genuinely does deliver everything that iOS promised as a beautiful, one-handed, easy to navigate, simple to use, good battery life, personal communication device, with some other fun features like a great camera, 4K video, decent headphone audio, not the best, but decent, and um, multimedia and capability, streaming, everything this phone delivers on. And it's the last year that, it's the last phone model that iOS was built for its original form factor. And everything since then, as iOS has gotten bigger, it's gotten a bit more cumbersome, it's gotten more complicated, it's gotten a little harder to navigate. Android and iOS are kind of meeting in the middle between all of the pretty stuff and all of the functional stuff. But this was the last year where navigating iOS in the way that iOS was designed to be used had the perfect hardware to software synergy. This was it. This phone is a baller Mighty Mouse today. Like it's still a gorgeous, competitive, sleek, fast computing device if you got your battery replaced, because battery throttling is a thing in iOS, which sucks. Um, but I pair this up with an Apple Watch. I have my Apple Watch Series 4 in a bucket in, in my closet behind me. And that's one of the best travel experiences I can point to. 
I'm walking through an airport. I'm moving my thumb through my uh, my iPhone SE. I've got my Apple Watch on. Like when we talk about Apple and it just works, that to me is the high point for Apple over these 10 years. An iPhone SE plus an Apple Watch is peanut butter jelly time for iOS consumers. And I feel like every product since then has been in some way a more expensive compromise to that core iPhone experience that we that we used to treasure that we valued so that's a lot <laughs> it's um Boeing by iPhone small edition <clears throat> um th that that that's a lot as we get into 2020 again to repeat myself a bit here I'm a lot less excited about what's going to come. Someone was asking me my predictions for an LG V60. I feel like an LG V60, which is generally the same as the V50, maybe an updated camera sensor, you get the Snapdragon 865, and refine the dual screen case so it's more like the G8X, done. It's not going to be a super exciting phone because I don't think LG can really dedicate all of the resources to making the most exciting phone they can because it's not gonna do well in the market anyway. It's a foregone conclusion that you should never buy LG, so says all of these YouTubers, right? So I'm actually kind of okay with that. If they can give me the headphone jack, keep those amazing camera features, and uh, it, it, if it arrives in the same shell, I don't care so much. You know, my favorite iPhones were the S model years, not the new form factor model years. I always think you get a better product when the company doesn't push so hard on design and instead refines all of the internals and makes the performance better and, and uh, you know, <clears throat> improves the internal capabilities. So, you know, a V60, just touch up a few of those things that are a little rough around the edges on the V50, and there's not a lot because the V50 is a solid device, and then make your manufacturing process easier for more regions to get the phone. And there's your LG strategy for 2020. I don't know that they can execute it. I don't know. I think that's what's so rough is we see you know, like HTC took an entire year off because that, that company just doesn't have any marketing muscle or any leverage, has zero relationships in the carrier space anymore. That, that's unfortunately where we're at. So as we get into 2020, I've been talking about this a lot. Again, Kyle Ruggles, we've been talking about the future tech for four or five years now. And the, the one product this year that got me excited about the future, like something that felt like future tech, were uh, the Focals. <clears throat> Sorry, I just bumped the mic again, something fierce. So the Focals by, by North are, you know, these heads-up display gl glasses. I'm going to put them on here because I, I, I think I look okay in glasses. And kind of get them right there on the bridge of my nose. The frames are a little wide for my face, but I, I should have gotten the one size smaller. But because of where this projector was, it was just ever so slightly in my peripheral vision when I got these. As we get into 2020, a faster processor, slightly better camera capabilities. Ooh, you can do 4K at 120 frames per second now or HDR 4K video. Yes, that's all going to be good. But that's not really driving the future of how we interact with products, data, and services. It's still the same slab. Maybe it's even a less, uh, a, a, a more fragile slab of computer. It's going to be stuff like this. As we get through next year, more audio products, heads-up displays, moving data into more organically accessible experiences. I don't want to get to the end of 2020 and the main consumer expectation is still we look at the world like this. Oh, something happened on my phone. Better pay all of my visual and tactile and audio attention to this glowing screen and block out everything else around me. I don't want to end 2020 where we ended 2019 because 2019 feels a lot like 2017. Just a little bit quicker, a little bit, uh, a little bit faster, and more glass than plastic and metal. You know, I want to see 
now that the smartphone is such a commodity, now that the smartphone is such a ubiquitous, commonplace device, this is now the time to start disrupting more areas of computing. The phone can start unseating laptops. But then something like this, wearable technologies, can start unseating the main bread and butter experiences on our phone. If you spend, if, if you're really into things like smartwatches, it's hard to spend time without a smartwatch. <clears throat> Over Thanksgiving, I forgot my charger. So my tick watch, I was just using it in step tracking mode. It'll last for a month on a charge if it's just a watch and it only just tracks your steps as a pedometer. Um, it's not connected to my phone at all. And that week was kind of miserable. I hated the experience of using my phone as a notifications platform. Especially someone like me. I get a lot of notifications. I get a lot of emails. I have a Discord server. I have my Reddit. I have social media out the wazoo. It is a terrible experience where every little beep and vibrate, you need to customize what is a high priority notification. I don't want to miss a text from my wife, but I also kind of want to be aware of what's happening on the rest of my internet existence. And you're constantly reaching and looking and reaching and looking and reaching and looking. And it's awful. It's bad. And if I had just thought to pack my focals, it would have been way less bad. <laughs> but I didn't want to travel with my focals with my family and have another thing I was taking care of. I thought I had packed my smartwatch charger. It was rough. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, yeah. I, I, it's not even like I think AR is going to take off next year. Um, I think it eventually will take off. I just don't think it's going to take off next year. But we're, we're in that tail end. 3D t TVs were a bust. HDR is commonplace now. Like, I don't know that you can buy a new decent TV that doesn't have smart functionality and HDR built into it. All of these little consumery things have all kind of peaked. They're all at max current tech. So now there's an opportunity and now there's potential for someone to come in and do something disruptive. Uh, maybe it's Amazon. That, that would kind of make me sad. But maybe it's Microsoft with HoloLens or maybe it's just someone we're not expecting. But, you know, VR isn't going to get it done on its own. AR isn't going to get it done until Apple and Samsung do it. And then it's popular. And then, of course, it's the right time to get it because only those two companies can sell us overpriced stuff that's less functional than what the current boutique manufacturers are making. But as Kyle Ruggles in the chat says, it's time to innovate. So as we go into 2020, I'm making another New Year's resolution that I'm going to try and focus my channel on disruptive tech and on hearing health. I'm still going to review phones. I'm not walking away from that. I still like phones. So I'm going to talk about phones. But if you have a phone from 2017, the functional experience of what you have today isn't that much different. And as we go into 2020, the functional experience of a phone in 2020 is going to be kind of the same as what we've had since 2018. Those two-year windows don't show disruption. They show evolution and they show iteration. Great. We're still going to talk about that but I really want to find the stuff that's going to help us put our phone down and stay connected. And I really want to find the stuff that can satisfy all of our senses, not just our, our vision, but also our hearing and do it safely so that we can preserve our hearing health. We can preserve our visual health. I want to incorporate technology more organically into the human condition, into the human experience, not making it so... You know, divisive. You know, I don't want this to divide me, separate me from the world around me. I want it to incorporate into the world around me. So that's that's the last bit. This podcast has run stupid long, and I want to thank all of you for for hanging with me. We this has been great. I, I have been looking through some of the live chat here. I haven't been able to keep up with all of this because, like I said, um, I don't know if I can if I can show this without messing up my camera too much. I'm gonna do this. So like just on my desk. 
So that's like a third of my museum of phones that I prepped just to talk about this stuff today with Sony's and iPhones and HTC's and LG's and Samsung's. Oh my. Let me and I bring this back to there. I can refocus. So again, wrapping up 2019, that contemplative mode, not just the year in review, but the decade in review, we've come so far, and yet I feel we got stuck somewhere. I still point to Qualcomm. After Qualcomm, I think we got stuck in what was safe. Now it's time to do risks again. To not listen to tech reviewers who are going to tell you to wait until there's a third or a fourth generation. So if a company's doing something exciting or a company's taking a real gamble or or is trying to disrupt something, we're going to get our hearts broken. It's going to suck. I love these focals. I don't know that this company will last for a Gen 2. It's a tiny little boutique company. They've got some Amazon cash. But there's so little guarantee. Like, it's very low probability that they're going to stick around for five years, right? But I want to be on that ride. I want to be in that car. I don't want to be in the safe car anymore. I don't want to be on Team Popular with my YouTube metrics, knowing that if I just say nice things about the two biggest companies in the world, that I'll be rewarded for it with more YouTube hits. It's time. It's time for all of us to take a few more risks, put our money where our mouth is, and actually celebrate the type of innovations that will will really move this industry forward instead of sitting back in the safety of, well, if they did this and this, and if they charged less, and if they made it magic somehow, then I would buy it. That's not the game anymore. That's dull. That's boring. That's played out. It's, it's time to, to reinvest. So that's where I hope you all will join me, where you will can at least appreciate where some of this channel is going to shift as I'm producing for YouTube and Twitch and doing this podcast, and that some of the focus is going to get spread out a bit on things that I, I feel improve the consumer experience and help move the industry forward more aggressively than if we let Apple dictate what the future of computing should look like. Because that's not the future I want. <laughs> so thank you all so much you you guys you 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 all have been an amazing resource in in helping me stay focused on creating the content that i want to make and you've just been so much fun to have these conversations with if we weren't having these types of conversations i wouldn't still be making videos i still wouldn't be hosting a podcast that's what's so special getting to the end of this year is finding this pocket community and knowing that we all probably disagree about a lot of stuff, but it's the debate which is invigorating. And where we end up at the end of those conversations is better than where we started those conversations. So thank you so much, um, Matt Tyler, Kyle, Gorin, Aditya, Sam, um, Andrew, uh, I don't think he's in here right now, uh, LFA, Boeing Bites, Everyone who's in this live chat, I'm missing. A, 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 there's a gym in here. <laughs> Dank Pikmin. I mean, this this was a, a phenomenal show to wrap up the year. This was a phenomenal year for exciting competition. And this was an interesting decade full of a lot of highs and lows. And so uh, if you're with family or if you're with friends, I, I would ask a silent toast to the future, I will clink a really fancy bourbon um, later tonight. If you'd like to join me with your beverage of choice, a drink to the future. Not right now, because it's 11.45 and I'm hungry and I need lunch. But at some point, in the back of your brain, just to send out some positive vibes, some positive mental energy, and that we can all wish and hope for the things that we want to see be the change we want to see in the world. And uh, I'll, I'll drink to that and I'll clink to that. So folks, um, we got to wrap this up. My voice is barely hanging on again. And this is where I failed two weeks ago and my, my voice went totally shot. So uh, again, happy holidays for whatever you might be celebrating or not celebrating or spending time with family, with friends, 
or if you just need that quiet and that downtime, go get that quiet, go get that downtime too. Um, this is a, an amazing and exciting and stressful time of year for all of us. So I, I hope you all are well, you're safe, warm, and well-fed. Uh, I'm going to be back next week. We're going to be doing a bit of uh, CES uh, commentary. I'm going to be shooting some videos for Newegg. I'm probably not going to Vegas, so I'm hoping I can take a sideline approach to making the podcast about all of the major announcements that we're going to be seeing from Vegas this year. It's crazy to think that CES is is right there. <laughs> like January 7 is go time. Um, that freaks me out. So um, I definitely check back in next week. We're going to be talking about that. I have one video shot and I have one video script to produce. So there's going to be something up on the YouTube channel after New Year's, uh, probably talking about the iPhone 11 Pro Max and probably comparing it to my favorite real pro phone of the year. So that's going to be a, a fun video that I'm going to get a lot of hateful comments on. And then uh, I'm going to have a couple articles out too. Be on the lookout for some of that Xperia 5 coverage. And then a ton of audio kit is coming your way. I've got MPOW. I've got Mixter. Low-cost Bluetooth headphones coming your way. LFA hooked me up with LiperTech and Tin Audio. So you've got some nice mid-ranger true wireless options and uh, cabled audio coming your way. And I've got some microphones to talk about again. Again, like plugging into a phone, plugging into a computer, plugging into a game console, ways for you to capture higher quality audio. It's going to get real rich for your ears over the next couple weeks as we kick off hashtag 2020 hearing. I'm really excited about this initiative. I hope I can count on you to help spread the word on treating your ears better in the new year. Folks, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to my blog, subscribing to my Twitch, subscribing to my YouTube. Um, I'm going to be back here next week with another Monday morning tech chat show, a little bit more news and a little bit more commentary. I want you all to have an amazing week with your technology. I want you to have an amazing New Year's, kicking off whatever you want to do to celebrate the new year. And I want to catch you back here next week. Do awesome with your technology. Be awesome with your technology. And a happy new year. The happiest of new years to you and your families. I love you all. Take care. Be well. I'll catch you back.